Tenakoto, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's my huge pleasure to welcome you to all to the inaugural Motor Neuron Disease New Zealand Research Conference. The conference is a result of many months of collaboration between MND New Zealand and our colleagues at the New Zealand MND Research Network, and we're very happy to see you all here today. Together, over the last few years, we've been building momentum around fostering and encouraging New Zealand-based MND research. Earlier this year, we launched the MND New Zealand Research Strategy, which highlights the need to work closely with clinicians, researchers, and our community. To stimulate conversation around research and bring people together, we have developed and held some key events this year. In June, we held a successful research afternoon, which some of you may have attended and enjoyed. Um, in September, we held a HUI, or a meeting for those people from overseas, um, which we held in Parliament. Um, and provided a platform for a broad spectrum of health professionals, government, and the MNZ New Zealand team to meet and discuss care pathways for people with MND and start the ball rolling to improve health care throughout New Zealand. Now we're ending the year on a high with today's event, the inaugural MND New Zealand Research Conference. And we're proud to be here today with a host of well-respected international and local speakers who would enlighten us with their latest updates and vital work in MND research and care. Thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules um, to travel to Auckland to share your knowledge and experience with the New Zealand MND community. I'd also like to thank at the stage Dr. Claire Riley. Where's Claire? There you are. <laughs> Hide in the corner. You were supposed to wait to do that. <laughs> Community and Research Advisor at MND New Zealand, and Lydia Everhart. <laughs> Manager of the MND Research Network, and the rest of the organising team who have been instrumental in making this day happen. So, another round of applause for the whole organisation team. <laughs> oh, hang on, somebody else is clicking my clicker. <laughs> What's going on? I'd like to acknowledge the following organisations, the Neurological Foundation, the Dairy Goat Cooperative and the Trust Community Foundation. And their generous financial support is very gratefully received and has helped bring this conference to life. There are a couple of small last minute changes to our programme, um, which I just need to let you know about. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Associate Professor Paul Tolman is unfortunately not able to make us it here today. Um, he was due to speak just after lunch, so there will be a few changes to the timetable around lunchtime, which I'll let you know about. Also, Zara Binte has recently been appointed curator of the New Zealand MND Registry. Congratulations, Zara. <laughs> and we'll be speaking in place of Associate Professor Richard Roxburgh. So before we start, I just have a bit of housekeeping for you. Um, you'll find the closest bathrooms in the pre-function area. So you go out of the pre-function area towards the lobby, turn right. Um, the smoking area is way, 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 way down out the way in City Road via the lower lobby if you need to go there. And in, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please follow the instructions from the Cordis team members who will guide you to the assembly point in City Road. Um, you've already let us know about your dietary requirements and food will be clearly labelled. So please take note of this when selecting from the buffet. You'll also see our photographer, Nicole, taking pictures. Nicole is also a speech-language therapist and has kindly volunteered her time to help out today, so thank you, Nicole. Um, photos will be used on social media and our communications about the conference, and we'll also be recording video footage throughout the day, which will be available online. As you can see, we have a very full schedule, and we'll do our utmost to keep to time, so if you can please ensure you return from breaks promptly, that will be hugely appreciated. The morning session will focus on understanding and diagnosing MND and will be hosted by Dr. Emma Scotter. In the afternoon, we will look at caring and supporting those with MND, and Professor Amar al Chalabi will host that session. The day will conclude with our keynote speaker, Professor Amar al Chalabi again. He's getting quite a, quite a full day. Um, and there'll also be time, to, uh, and our closing address, and there'll also be time for questions, so please put your thinking caps on. So let's get this conference started. I'm delighted to introduce distinguished Professor Sir Richard Fall, Director of the Centre for Brain Research and Medical Patron for MND New Zealand to deliver our opening address. Sir Richard developed the Centre for Brain Research in 2009, which is coincidentally celebrating its 10th anniversary this week. And it is now one of the most 
preeminent pre neuroscience research centres in Australasia. Qualified in both medicine and science, Sir Richard is internationally recognised for his scientific contributions to neurodegenerative diseases of the human brain. He established the internationally recognised New Zealand Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank and is involved in a wide range of community organisations associated with supporting patients and families with neurological disorders, including being medical patron of MND New Zealand. Sir Richard's contribution to research has been recognised through many awards, too long to list here, including appointments as Officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit and as Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. And we're deeply honoured to have Sir Richard here to deliver our opening address. Well, thank you, Carl. Um, you know, I'm really just a Taranaki boy who got a love for the brain and um, got involved with the community and did brain been doing brain research for 40 years. And that's, that's, I love it. I absolutely love it. And you know what I love? I love coming to occasions like this when you bring whole communities together. You bring researchers together, you bring clinicians together, you bring people from every walk of life together, and most of all, you bring families together. Because I always tell my people at work, you know, the, um, our Centre for Brain Research, not the CIA, you've got to get out there and you've got to tell people about the research breakthroughs, the research opportunities, and you give people hope. And of course, the families give you the most incredible support ever. For us at the centre, and the motor neuron, you know, people throughout New Zealand, the families give us their brain and spinal cord to do research on. And that has got them, that's the most wonderful gift ever. You can't put a figure on that. It enables us to do fantastic research. It enables us you know, to have our group led by our star, um, Emma Scotter, and we collaborate with people like, um, you know, um, what's the name? Um, <laughs> um, Chris, <laughs> sitting right next to him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, um, it's these things which give patients, give families future, you know, they give them opportunities where they see we are going to do something about this. So for this conference, this inaugural conference, MMD New Zealand has actually launched this for the very first time. This is the inaugural conference. They are the most wonderful active organisation. I went to Yahoo in Wellington. I went on the walk in Auckland here a few weeks ago. We got drenched in water, but there were over 400 people there. Marvellous. And this community engagement, engagement can move mountains, and it does. So um, thank you for just asking me to be your medical patron. It is an incredible privilege. This meeting today is, is wonderful because it's inaugural. It's wonderful because you've attracted some heavyweights from around the world. You've attracted experts from Dublin, Oxford, King's College, London, Kent, Walter and Eliza Institute in Melbourne, and so on. You've got our New Zealand experts from right across the border here. They're coming together. It's a multidisciplinary, I'd call it a multidisciplinary summit for New Zealand on MND, where you're going to exchange information, you're going to talk together with health professionals, you're going to, the clinicians are going to talk with the scientists, you're going to hear the latest research, and this is a, a melting pot, which is going to give families and people with MND, you know, hope for the future. And that's always got to be good. We cannot do this enough. So I hope this is going to be a regular event and we need to do it every few years, whatever. But I mean, having 150 people in the room today um, and having from all walks of life, that's what, that's what New Zealand does well. We do it and it's interesting, you know, it's, often it's the quite rare diseases like Huntington's disease, motor neuron disease and other types of disease where you can actually, they, people do this much more effectively than some of the other major diseases. And that's really important. And there's a real, I've been working at Huntington's disease for over well, almost 40 years. And we get together every two years in Boston. It's a family. Everyone's there. And this is a family. You know, you can move mountains by family and never, ever forget that the people who we're doing the great science for, the great clinical developments, improving care, palliative care, all types of care, the person who we're here for is the person who's touched by this terrible disease. <laughs>
and their families. So I'd just like to say thank all the overseas people who have travelled, thank all the New Zealanders who are involved with this, because you're wonderful people, you're wonderful people because you're giving hope and also what, what you work out and solve for this disease is going to help all the other brain diseases, all the other diseases. And that's wonderful. You're tra trailblazers and it's an absolute privilege to be here. And um, I don't know, can I declare the conference open? Absolutely. So there we are. <laughs> a final word just to say to Claire, you're the face of this association and you're wonderful. And to Lydia, you two have driven this conference, you've made it happen. And today is, you know, you can sit back and relax and have fun. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Richard. As enjoyable a presentation as ever. I feel quite humbled by some of those words you said. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce the chair for this morning's session, Dr. Emma Scotter. Dr. Scotter heads the Motor Neuron Disease Lab at the Centre for Brain Research. In 2017, she established the Motor Neuron Disease Research Network to connect research groups across New Zealand, including us being here today. Dr. Scotter is also the steering, a steering committee member of the New Zealand MND Patient Registry. Dr. Scotter's research team investigates the molecular mechanisms of MND pathogenesis with a focus on protein quality control and genetic modifiers thereof, using patient post-mortem brain cells and tissues. While New Zealand's population is small, Dr. Scotter's research has shown that our rates of MND are amongst the highest in the world. Through collaboration with MND research groups and pharma internationally, Dr. Scotter aims to have New Zealanders included in genetic cohort studies and to enable access for New Zealanders to emerging gene-based therapies. It's great to have Dr. Scotter here today to chair this morning's session and presenting a team's recent work, exploring where the barrier breakdown in ALS correlates with regions of a high TDP43 protein pathology in tissue. Welcome, Dr. Emma Scotter. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today. This is the realization of a number of months of work by a lot of people, and it's just an absolute privilege, and I'm really humbled by the number of people that are here. Um, I think the turnout today really demonstrates that there's a growing interest in MND research in New Zealand and growing capacity, which is what we are really aiming for. It's exciting to see us gaining this momentum and also to see us uh, connecting with our international colleagues. I think those collaborations are really going to propel our, uh, our progress forward. I'm looking forward to sharing more about my team's uh, research progress with you later this morning. But for, for now, I'm going to chair session one uh, on diagnosing and understanding MND. So I'll briefly introduce each speaker before they deliver their talk and I'll ask that you please save any questions until the end of the session. Then I'll host a full panel discussion with all the speakers from session one and session two will follow the same format. So it's my pleasure first to introduce today's first speaker, Professor Orla Hardiman. Orla is one of only two professors of neurology. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Professor Hardiman is one of only two professors of neurology in Ireland, and she heads the academic unit of neurology at Trinity College. She's also a consultant neurologist at Beaumont Hospital, and she's the director of the National Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis, which we'll refer to as ALS, uh, service. Her leadership in ALS research, and particularly ALS epidemiology, is recognised worldwide. And we had a wonderful conversation with Orla last night. It's been a real pleasure to have this, um, this chance to have her informing our, uh, our practice here in New Zealand. So here to present her talk, What is ALS and Why is it so difficult uh, to find effective treatments? Please put your hands together for Orla Hardiman. From one small island to another small island. We actually have a relatively similar population, I think about four and a half, five million. Um, so what we're going to talk about really is what you can do with a small island, actually. That's, um, so what, most of what I'm going to talk about today is stuff that we've done in Ireland over the last 25 years, contextualising it internationally. And um, if we can do it um, with no money um, and no resources, then you can do it with um, more money, probably, and more resources. So um, what we, we call it ALS, um, 
or MND. In Ireland, it's called MND, but I, I trained in the US. So we kind of use it interchangeably. So ALS or MND is a motor neuron generation of adults. We know that. We know it's actually the commonest motor neuron disease, the commonest neurodegeneration, actually, um, if you exclude MS, um, of young and, and midlife. And that's something people don't really appreciate or recognize. It's seen as a rare disease. But actually, the incident is not that dissimilar to MS. It's 2.6 per 100,000 in Ireland. And I think it's quite similar here, actually. It, the pathogenesis of it, is, or the, how it starts, is not very well understood. Um, the frequency of familiar motor neuron disease depends on how you measure it. It's somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, and I'll come back to that later in my talk. And it's uniformly fatal. We don't have a treatment yet. But there are some other caveats to this. So, for example, the instance is 2.6 per 100,000 if you're a population that's of European extraction. But if you're from a population that's mixed, the rates are probably lower. So we have a lot of work to do to understand why that is. If the rates are lower in other populations, what's protecting those populations? So that's something that, that's been a focus of my work over, over the last few years as well. Um, as I said, 10 to 30 percent, depending on the metric. I think Amar will talk a little bit at the end about the genetics and the idea of familial versus um, so-called sporadic and, and this idea that it's probably more like a continuum with the level of, of engagement of the genes being more or less um, and it's very uniformly fatal, that's true as well, but it has a very variable progression, and some people can do very well. So in our clinics, we need to make that clear to people when we diagnose them, that actually some people can do really well with motor neuron disease, and some people can progress quite slowly. So, it's, it's, it, so these are all, all, I think, aspects of the disease that, that, get, that are nuanced that get lost in the larger uh, uh, statistics that we use. We know it's a recognisable clinical syndrome because we're all here today to talk about ALS or motor neuron disease. But I think that the um, key word there, we know that it's a, a syndrome rather characterised by the decline in function of upper motor neurons in the brain to spine and lower motor neurons coming from the spine out to the muscle. So as a clinical diagnosis, that's what we use to diagnose the disease. But we also know that it's, it's more than that. It's, it's more, um, there are various different aspects or components to motor neurons and it's variable across different patients. So I think um, clinical syndrome is the correct word. And, and that means that it's probably heterogeneous. And this is, we, this is what we know at the moment. We know that the, um, the uh, upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons are affected. That is the motor axis. We know that's a core part of motor neuron disease. And if you don't have that, then, um, then you don't have motor neuron disease. But we also know that there are other aspects of the neural axis that are quite markedly involved. And the more we study this, the more we realize that actually these are integral parts of the disease as well. And I think if we exclude these parts of the brain as being involved, then we lose part of the nuance of what is motor neuron disease or ALS. And we need to be aware of that. It's only in the last 10 or 15 years that we recognized the extra motor components of motor neuron disease. This is a feature of many neurodegenerative diseases, actually, that there are many overlaps in these diseases that heretofore we hadn't really fully recognized. In, in um, motor neuron disease, there's a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex involvement, circuit involvement, and that, that changes emotional and behavioral regulation. There's a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that changes executive function, so, so planning. And there's the anterior cingulate sing gyrus that affects motivation and initiation. These are very important aspects of motor neuron disease and aspects that we, we hadn't, as I said, heretofore recognised. They cause great distress often for family members, particularly the emotional re uh, regulation and the social cognition. Um, be these behavioural change, le changes lead to a lot of caregiver burden, so the things that we need to recognise. So if we, if we recognize ALS as a disease syndrome rather than a disease entry, entity, that implies that is heterogeneous. And I think the, the theme of the International Symposium that we've all just come from in, in um, wherever we were sometime in the last, <laughs> uh, in the air somewhere, um, in Perth, um, I think is this idea of, of disease heterogeneity. And I think the theme today with all of the speakers will also be around heterogeneity, particularly in Angela's talk when she talks about trials and in Chris's talk when he's going to talk about gene therapies. This is about understanding the, the subcomponents of motor neuron disease and really trying to tease those out so we can get effective treatments. So I'm going to talk about the heterogeneity as a clinician scientist and also from the insights that we've had over the years in our 
uh, clinic and actually we ran a register and pretty much everything that we've learned from motor neuron disease in Ireland is predicated on having a population-based registry. So I think having a population-based registry in New Zealand is really important. So I'm going to talk about clinical heterogeneity, genetic heterogeneity, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of, of networks, about neurophysio the neurophysiology as opposed to the neuroanatomy or neuropathology of MND. Because the more I've studied this, the more I think that we should be thinking, be thinking in terms of networks. And that actually opens up a whole other avenue of potential therapeutics as well. From a clinical point of view, we know that there are gender differences, which nobody has really ever been able to um, uh, explain adequately. We have some work, which I'm not going to show today, showing that uh, there's a gender difference in heritability as well, in, in that um, we know that ALS is inherited, but 50% of, of, of ALS is probably genetic, but um, the transmission is more likely to occur from female. So we don't really understand why that is. Uh, we know that the age of onset is a bit different. It, it's a... Uh, it's a bit, um, it, it occurs um, earlier in men, uh, and it's more likely to be spinal onset, and later in women, and more likely to be bulbar onset. And we haven't ever really actually been able to establish why that is. There are, there's quite a lot of work uh, going on, I think, within the um, immunology field and cell biology field, suggesting that there are actual um, uh, sex differences at that level. But we need to understand that uh, um, much more. And we haven't, we haven't really established. It's true in animals as well. Uh, we know also that there are extreme phenotypes. We know that in motor neuron disease, there's a, a form of motor neuron disease, or ALS, called PLS, primary lateral sclerosis, which is a purely upper motor neuron syndrome. And it probably is a similar disease. We have families where you have PLS in one part of the family and ALS in another part of the family. So the mechanisms or the causes are probably not that dissimilar, but PLS has a much longer um, uh, duration. We, I've been um, running our clinic in, in Ireland since um, 1994. I was 12 when I started. Um, <laughs> And, um, and the patients that we diagnosed with PLS, um, we haven't lost anybody with PLS. So it's, it's a much, much longer disease course. Spinal muscular atrophy is pure lower motor neuron. Uh, we don't actually have very many patients with, with pro progressive muscular atrophy um, in, in Ireland, although there's a larger cohort in um, Leonard Vandenberg has a large cohort in, in Holland. So there may be some population-based differences as well in the way the disease expresses itself. And then there's these very rare forms like flail arm, which is the arms become weak and nothing else, or flail leg syndrome. And they have different clinical courses, as this is a, um, some of Mars work over it, from King's Hospital, uh, using the King's Registry, showing that these uh, conditions, like I said, have much de different uh, progression. So uh, um, primary muscular atrophy and, P and PLS have much slower progression than the, and, and flail arm and flail leg have, have a very good prognosis as well. We don't understand why that is either. Why do we get um, these restricted forms of ALS? We, we, um, we also know that the progression of ALS uh, differs. So this is the um, ALS functional rating scale, and this is a slide that many of us use. It's, it's from um, one of the studies that was um, undertaken using lithium, showing the, the um, course of, of individual patients. Um, the, the scale starts at 48, which is essentially normal, and then down to um, a zero. But, but it's a evidence of progressive disability. I'm going to talk about the LSFRS a little bit further on. But you can see that there's a huge variability in the way the condition progresses as well. Some people moving very fast and some people moving very slow. And we don't know why that is. Um, this is, again, a slide from uh, Amar showing that you can identify um, five different subgroups um, based on the... Um, uh, the um, uh, based on cluster analysis, but actually what those subgroups mean from a clinical point of view, we don't really know either. We know what the predictors of survival are now. Um, many of us who run registers have been able to do this, been able to select out um, aspects of the disease, um, clinical aspects of the disease that we can find actually in the first clinic, and these include age of onset, um, size of onset, bulb or spinal, how long it takes to make the diagnosis. So the longer it takes to make the diagnosis, the better. Um, the slope of the LSFRS, although I have some issues with that, the breathing, and then the, um, we know that some forms of motor neuron disease, uh, CNNORF72 being the commonest gene variant in European populations, um, that, that's associated mostly with a more progressive disease, but not absolutely, and, and cognition. So I'm going to talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. So age of onset, this is from our register. So you can see that people who... Um, Develop disease very at, at a very young age, um, have a much slower course, 
uh, than people who disease, develop disease very, at a very old age. And Amar um, and Leonard Vandenberg and I, um, using the um, um, our population-based data sets have been able to show, for example, that Stephen Hawking's uh, clinical course was as we might have expected because he was very young when, when he developed motor neuron disease. Um, so, so age of onset is very important. Site of onset as well, this is a really old slide from our very first register. It was actually done by um, uh, Brian Trainer, who was a fellow who worked with me, who then went on and became very famous. Uh, he was involved in the discovery of c 72 But again, showing that um, people with um, bulbar onset disease um, here, and these are two different cohorts from our register a long time ago. Unfortunately, this hasn't changed that much, um, but bulbar onset disease um, has a much poorer prognosis than spinal onset disease. Um, we also know that cognition is important, um, and we know that the presence of cognitive change is um, important. This is some work we did um, a few years ago looking at, um, again, cluster analysis, and these are the determinants within the clusters that we looked at. And um, when we added in um, cognition, we're able to show that cognitive change has a much uh, poorer prognosis than those with other, um, um, the, uh, which, which, which drives some of the, the, the patients who have um, a, a poorer outcome. So those who have a, a good outcome tend to be cognitively intact. Um, so we went on then and looked at the population-based frequency of um, cognitive change in, um, in ALS, and we... we um, so this is a, um, showing the, the frequency of, of change in a population-based data set. So I keep on. Um, so you can see that about half the patients uh, in, in our Irish population remained in, uh, cognitively intact throughout the disease. But about 14% about of patients were, had a dementia, quite a severe dementia, at presentation. And then the, the, the remain, remainder had evidence of executive or non-executive impairment. And, and of course, Sharon Abrahams from Scotland and Thomas Pack went ahead and did a, uh, developed a screening tool called the ECAS that allows us to select these patients out. This was done using very detailed neuropsychological um, evaluation. Um, we, we went on then and looked at uh, a bit more data that didn't really come out very well, but we, we, it, it, it turns out actually that language change is actually quite important as well. We hadn't appreciated that at the time when we did the study, so this isn't published yet, but language change is actually quite an important and, and can be an early feature of ALS. Those patients who are cognitively intact at the time of first presentation generally do remain cognitively intact, but they do lose some ground over time as well. I don't have time to show that, but there is a, a slight decline in those patients as well. Um, and it, I think it probably has to do with burden of disease. Cognitive change is important because those with executive dysfunction, this is, this is very early data that we showed, but it's, it's uh, uh, the subsequent work that we did confirms this, that those who have changes of planning and thinking um, have a much poorer outcome, probably related to the burden of disease, than those patients who, who don't. And um, I... I had a slide showing that, but it's, it's um, executive function is, drives the, the poor outcome in those with cognitive change. So if we see patients with executive change, that's a negative prognostic indicator. But behavioral change is, is also very important. Um, sometimes when we test our patients, they can score very highly and do and with all of the thinking tests. But when we start asking their families, you know, has there been any change in, in the person's ability to uh, be empathic, the person's ability to understand other people's points of view, their motivation, their, the, um, how they interact, uh, we see many changes uh, that are very disruptive to, to daily living. So we looked at this in a, in a systematic way um, at a cross-sexual level, and we were able to seg segregate patients into different types of behavioural change. And actually, when you look at this from a, a, the, what we know about the circuitry within the brain, we can find that there are a number of different circuits that we can um, identify using neuropsychological testing or, or based on our, our, what we understand about neuropsychology that subdivide patients into different subgroups based on their behavioural change. So, so again, that brings up the idea that there's a, there are different pathways or networks that become affected in different patients and that not everything is the same. The behavioural change is also heterogeneous um, in addition to the cognitive change. Now, I, I mentioned all these predictors of survival, but I left out one that's really important, and I think Chris is going to talk about that uh, later on this morning or this afternoon, and that's the presence of multidisciplinary care. We had a chat about this last night, and that is really important, and of, of all of the things that we can 
um, adjust now in the absence of the treatments that Andrew's going to talk about or Chris is going to talk about, providing a multidisciplinary care is really important. And that's not just me saying it. There's a, a, a significant and a body of evidence now to support this. So we were the first to show this actually in 2003, but we did a second study um, uh, a few years ago where we compared um, our multidisciplinary clinic in Dublin with the multidisciplinary clinic led, led by Colette Donaghy in Belfast. The difference between our, clinic, between our clinics are that we're very controlling in Dublin. I don't like letting people back to the local uh, community neurologist. I like to control everything that we do, and we have a network of nurses that do home visits, and we make all the decisions centrally, and we have a multidisciplinary team that's very, um, that's very expert now. Uh, whereas Colette, because of the nature of the NHS in, in Belfast, has, provides a devolved service. And, and we showed that actually centralised service with all the decision making happening centrally is, provides a much better outcome by, by about nine months to, to uh, devolved care. There's a third line there, which is hard to see, but that's patients who attend their local neurologist, so they do least well. So, so this is very compelling evidence, and it's been recapitulated in other centres. Chris has recapitulated in, in, in it's been recapitulated in, in Turin and in, um, in, in, in the Netherlands and also in the US and many other sites showing that really our, 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 we, we have an obligation to provide centralised multidisciplinary care. That's a significant uh, prognostic indicator as well. So that's our... Uh, that's, uh, so how do we address this clinical heterogeneity? Well, in terms of survival, um, Leonard Vandenberg, and, um, with one of his, his uh, postdocs, Henkian Vestingen, uh, looked at the population-based registries that we have across Europe, and were able to generate um, a predictive model for survival um, based on our registers using uh, these uh, factors, these determinants that I mentioned, so the uh, um, uh, symptom onset, uh, the presence or absence of cognitive change, the length of time for first symptom, the age of onset, and, and can, can generate a, a statistically um, um, uh, reproducible model of survival. And this is the way that we're able to show that uh, Stephen Hawking um, um, survived within the parameters that we would have predicted based on these outcomes. So this is a, you can divide patients into different subgroups, and this is a, some of the data that it's in, in Lancet Neurology. Uh, so that's very valuable if you're thinking about survival. But many trials don't use survival, in, particularly in the US. Many trials and many of the, uh, the regulatory authorities in the US in particular use the slope of the ALS, FRS, revised to determine whether a drug works or not. Um, so the ALS, FRS, Change is a primary outcome measure in, in many trials, and I think Andrew will probably talk a little bit about this. I really don't like this scale at all. Um, my views on it are, are well rehearsed and, and well known. Um, it's a 48-point scale, as I said, um, but uh, there's a problem with it in, in that it, 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 it has many um, limitations in terms of subscores, and it doesn't include cognition. So we also use vital capacity, but vital capacity... Oh, it can only be measured in some patients. So people with bulbar onset disease have great difficulty making a seal around the, the um, uh, uh, machine that measures vital capacity. So we lose a lot of patients uh, who we might be able to put on trial because these are the outcome measures that we, that we use. This is a, a, a breakdown of the subtypes of the LS, FRS. And you can see that... Um, it's not at all linear, that it, that it, it floors and seedings in many different places. And um, we assume that this, this, the decline in LSRS is, is linear because the competence scale is linear because we made it linear mathematically. It's essentially a, a quantitative conversion of a set of qualitative measurements that we kind of made to be linear. But, but there are many limitations in the LSFRS, and I think we need um, uh, much better clinical markers of disease progression. And we also really need markers of cognitive and behavioral change as well. Um, the, uh, the other types of heterogeneity, genetic heterogeneity, uh, I think Amar will talk a little bit about, so I'm not going to talk very much about it, other than to say that these are, it's a relative, this is a relatively old slide, but uh, ALS is a, is a continuum um, in terms of the disease syndrome from uh, those who've got significant cognitive change to those who have uh, no cognitive change at all, at all. And we know that many genes will influence this and some genes will drive cognitive change um, in one direction or the other. Um, some genes are mostly genes that are associated with dementia and some genes are mostly associated with patients without dementia. And then there are many genes that are associated with both and we don't really understand why that is. Um, Many of these um, chain differences in clinical phenotype and clinical presentation may be driven, as I said, genetically, but also based on, an, on many, many, many 
uh, groups of susceptibility genes that are inherited differentially. And that may also be a function of where uh, we come from or our ancestral origin. We know this already in CNN-OFF. CNN-OFF 72 um, is a northern European gene. It's, it's probably um, um, the, the um, highest rates are, are in Scandinavia, up in the, the Rus population, probably uh, the mutation started there. It's really, really uncommon in Asia. It's really uncommon in, in South America. Um, and in Africa. And this is true both for, for ALS and for frontal temporal dementia. So, so, we, we, so just e even bit major genes, genes of major effect, have, have differential um, expression. So for example, in Ireland, we can't participate in the SOD1 trials because we have no patients with SOD1 variants in Ireland. Um, um, we, we looked at this in a bit more detail in, in, in South America, and we've got a collaboration ongoing in, in, um, in Latin America now. So this is work we did a few, uh, actually 10 years ago where we looked at the uh, frequency of ALS in Cuba based on skin color and compared that with um, the frequency in Ireland. This is actually mortality data. We're doing a, a, an instant-based study now. But you can see that the populations, first of all, the y-axis is different. In Ireland, it's 20. Well, it goes up 20, it goes up to 6. But also, there's a difference in, in um, the ancestral groups. So those who are of European extraction, those who are self-reported as white, have higher rates than those those who are uh, mixed of mixed ancestral origin. The, the population structure in Cuba is, is quite mixed, but they all have the same environmental influence. It's a very mixed population. So the only explanation for this is genetic. So this is fairly compelling evidence that there are uh, genetic factors, and mixing the genetics um, is actually um, probably very good for you. Um, now, <laughs> um, that's very difficult for us in Ireland, actually. <laughs> it would mean marrying somebody from Cork. <laughs> Um, so we've also been looking at, at other disease that might run with motor neuron disease. Uh, as a clinician, I've been taken by the sort of, there are bits of the disease when we examine people that um, don't really fit with the clinical criteria. And also we, um, being a clinician for a very long time and, and having large populations, we were picking up this clinical signal of other diseases running within families. So we did a case control study um, a few years ago where we looked at other diseases that might run within families of people with motor neuron disease. And to our surprise, we found that there were higher rates of schizophrenia in first degree relatives with motor neuron disease, and also higher rates of suicide in first degree relatives of people with motor neuron disease. And, and th these happened in other generations. It wasn't that you know, people got upset because someone in the family had motor neuron disease. These are real signals. And when we looked at this in terms of the genetics, it was partly being driven by C9, but, but not completely. Um, this, there was a signal in the non-C9 populations as well for both of these um, um, neuropsychiatric conditions. We then went and looked at this in, in more detail. So we've done three of these studies now and, and uh, found, found the same signal. It's been, it's been re um, replicated also in um, Australia, actually. Emma Devaney in, in, has, has done a very similar study. Um, but we, it, this is being driven by individual families. So there's about 30% of our patients come from families where there's a much higher neuropsychiatric signal than, than you would expect compared to control. So we've, we, what we see now is that these conditions run in family members of people with motor neuron disease. So we've done this, um, this three times now epidemiologically. So uh, there's no other explanation that I can think of other than this has to be uh, a genetic um, susceptibility. So we went and uh, tested that hypothesis by looking at the genome-wide association studies that we had for ALS and, and um, combining those with the genome-wide association studies for um, these um, neuropsychiatric disorders. And we showed that overlap is, is there in schizophrenia, about 14% overlap between ALS and schizophrenia. And actually, it's, it's also there for bipolar. Uh, we didn't see it on this study, but we've subsequently shown it's there for bipolar, and it links with cognitive change in, in patients with ALS. So the shared pathogenesis of ALS and other conditions, psychiatric conditions, we show this using two different methods. We don't really understand the mechanism, but to me, it suggests that there's more than one biological process and raises this possibility that this could be related to neuronal networking and, and, and the, the way our brains are put together in terms of circuitry, in terms of networks, the physiology as opposed to the anatomy of the brain. So that led us to, to, to build a whole new part of the research program. And actually, Roshi McMacken, who's a, a graduate student um, in, in, in our group, a um, very clever girl, um, she, she, she's actually driving a lot of this work in, in our group now. So we, we wanted to study the heterogeneity of LS using a, a network-based approach. And one of the days, ways that we wanted to do this was imaging. And the other was, was looking at brain patterns, signal patterns using spectral EEG. And so we've done quite a bit of work on this. It's, it's, it's fairly recent. It's only in the last couple of years we've been 
been really publishing on this. And uh, of course, we're following on Martin's work, and Martin, I'm sure, will talk about his own work on this as well. So this is a study that we did recently where we showed characterized patterns of cortical networking um, in, in, in ALS, suggesting that the disease, that the, there's an, a widespread disruption of brain networking in ALS. And these are some of the pretty pictures we can generate showing changes using these parameters based on neurophysiology of, of parts of the brain that become, uh, that, where, where the network changes. Um, so so um, we, we've shown, we've also been able to segregate patients out into, into different subgroups. This is, isn't published yet. This is a, a very bright lad called Stefan Ducic did this work. And um, he was able to separate patients into different clusters based on their um, networking and was able to show that those changes uh, correlate with um, clinical uh, phenotypes. So I don't, I don't have time to show them. So but the summary are that resting state EEG is an objective measure, ca captures heterogeneity and suggests that they're stable phenotypes. And these shows different, these, these um, network changes show different um, uh, trends in progression and survival, suggesting that the brain networking um, is different in different sub uh, subgroups of patients. Uh, so where do we go from here? Well, I think eventually, this is um, sort of my great, um, I'm kind of stealing some of what Amara's going to say, uh, but I, I think going forward, we'll have to separate all of the types of MND into different attributes. And actually, I kind of like this idea because I think this works for other diseases like uh, other neuro neurodegenerative diseases as well. Because, because if we think about this in terms of particular att attributes, we can do this based on clinical phenotype, based on the presence of a family history of neuropsychiatric disease, based on cognitive or behavioral networking, um, based on, on some of the more basic science aspects, we might be able to separate pa patients out in different groups. And they may all be, um, they may overlap to some extent. We could make uh, clusters of patients and then we could use some measurements, uh, new measurements or markers uh, that, are being, that are currently in evolution. And then going forward, we'll have a, uh, a precision medicine approach where these, we might, for example, select out drugs that affect behavior or drugs that affect cognition and combine those that drugs, uh, with drugs that affect um, um, other aspects of the disease at a biological level. And then we would, might, we would have many different sub, um, uh, subgroups of patients with different therapeutic interventions. So we might look to modulate the genetic uh, components um, of, of the disease with one therapeutic option. We might want to change network integrity, integrity with a different therapeutic strategy. Um, we might want to look at neuroprotection with a different therapeutic strategy. And we'll, different, we'll need different outcomes for these. But I think the future is now. I think that we're almost ready to be able to do this. I think it's a really exciting time. Andrew will probably tell us about many hundreds of drugs that are in um, early, early drug development. But we need to get our act together so that we can really drive the precision medicine approach going forward. But I think it's a really exciting time. I want to stay around for another little while to see this happening. I want, I want, see, I want to see new treatments. So to conclude, ALS is definitely a syndrome. We're getting better at defining subphenotypes. Um, there are new treatments. They will be driven by precision medicine, and there's al it's already happening. It's happening with the genomics. Um, but we need better patient selection and better trial design but, and better outcome measures. But we're getting there because we recognize the mistakes that we've made so far. So this is the team, and um, uh, Roisin is, is in the audience here. Uh, there she is there. Um, and this is the funding that we have. So thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I think that was a wonderful introduction to the, um, to the topics that we'll be talking about today. And um, I think really uh, outlines a feeling of hope that we have in the field. So our next speaker I'd like to introduce is Grace Chen. She hails from the Centre for Public Health Research at Massey University in New Zealand, where she has been based since completing her postgraduate diploma in public health with distinction. Grace's current PhD thesis focuses on identifying occupations and specific occupational and environmental exposures which increase risk of MND. Please join me in welcoming Grace to present her talk on self-reported occupational exposures and MND in New Zealand. Yes, thank you, Emma, and thank you, everybody. So in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about the MND study in New Zealand, which I will focus on the occupational exposures and the risk of MND. Yeah. 
So the MND study in New Zealand was founded by New Zealand House Research Council, and here is the all our team. And I declare no conflicts of interest. So as we know, MND is more common in male than in female. The ratio is three to two. And the incident and prevalence rate is relatively uniform across in the Western society, so Western countries. The incident rate is around two to three per 100,000, and the prevalence rate is around six to seven per 100,000. But there is no estimate national incident or prevalence rate in New Zealand. But there are around 100 new cases each year, and around 100, uh, 300 cases living at any one time in New Zealand. The MND mortality rate in New Zealand is around 2.8 per 100,000, which is similar with the MND mortality rate in UK, but is higher than the global mean estimate mortality rate of 1.7. So most MND case is sporadic, and the inherited form of MND is count around 10% of all cases. So the etiology of most of case is still largely unknown, but there are some suspected occupational, environmental, and lifestyle risk factors are associated with MND by a numbers of studies. So the occupational risk factors are exposure to agricultural chemicals, EMF, electric shocks, or exposure to neurotoxic to neuro agent like solvent, lead, and mercury heavy metals, exposure to welding films, fumigant, or work as a military service or professional soccer players. The environmental and lifestyle risk factors are smoking, rural living, and head injury. So the New Zealand study is a population-based case control study to investigate the occupational environmental risk factors and the risk of MND. So in this presentation, I will focus on the occupational exposures and the risk of MND by using the self-report drug-related exposures. So this study consists of 321 cases and 605 controls. All cases were diagnosed with MND by a neurologist, and both incident and prevalence cases was recruited in, through the study in order to achieve uh, adequate sample size. So the case was recruited through Motor New Disease Association National Register, which is the client-based register, and also through national minimum data set, which is hospital inpatient and day patient data. All the controls was recruited through New Zealand electoral for two controls for one case, frequency matched age and gender with the case. So both case and controls was recruited between 2013 and 2016. We collect um, information based on demographic details, personal details like you know, the family histories, and lifestyle factors, residential history, and the full lifetime working history. And identical data collection method was used for both case and controls. So we provide a telephone interview, face-to-face -face interview, or post-request needs. So all the participants have to ask list all the jobs they ever hold for six months or more, and for each job they have to give detailed information on these 11 different occupational exposure groups, which are dust, fibers, environmental tobacco smoke, and secondhand smoke at work, and other smoke or fumes, gas, fumigant, oil, solvent, acid or acolytes, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides or timber preservative, other chemical product, animal or animal product, Participants have to give the name of the each special specific exposures and have to give the details of which job or job task relate to these exposures and how long they're exposed to and how often they're exposed to, like how many days a week and how many hours a day, or how many weeks a year, and also to give the industry where they work for. And then all the jobs have to according to a New Zealand standard occupation which we use the five-digit code, and industries are coded according to Australia and New Zealand standard of industry classification. And we use the logistic regression to determine the odd ratio for ever being exposed to a particular exposure compared to never being exposed to that particular exposure. 
and we use New Zealand Depression Index to determine the socioeconomic status for both case and controls. So among the 321 case and 605 controls, we collected around 6,319 jobs with a full job history, which reflect on 2,755 occupations and 3,149 industries in New, in New Zealand, and more than 10,000 data on self-report exposures was collected and analyzed. So the numbers of occupation hold for case and controls was no different. The mean was 6.8. This is mean for each participant, they had around seven jobs around their lifetime. So the characteristic of the static population showed in this table. So 60% of the case are female, uh, male, compared with 36% um, of male, uh, of female, sorry. This 64% six, of male compared with 36 of female, and more than 60% of cases are over 60%, over six, over six years of age, sorry. Yeah. And 90% of um, Pakeha or New Zealand Europeans. However, there's no difference between the case and controls in terms of smoking, ethnicities, uh, depression, social economic status, and education. But when we look at um, job-related exposures and MND risk, there are some strong associations with indeed in this table. As we can see, the people exposed to fumigant had an uh, old ratio was 2.4. That is meant if they exposed to fumigant at workplace had 2.4 times to develop MND compared with people never exposed to fumigant at work. And similar result was also showed for people exposed to fungicides, incendicides, herbicides, or timber preservative, out ratio is 1.44. Exposure to other chemical product, out ratio is 1.5. And exposure to animal and animal product, the out ratio is 1.4. So this result reinforced our previous findings on occupations and amenity risk, which we published in early this year. In particular, exposure to fungicides, um, incendicides, herbicides, timber preservative, and fumigant, which consistent with our previous findings on horticulture occupations, which we find people who work as a gardener, fruit grower, or vegetable grower, all had elevated rates for MND. And exposure to animal and animal product was also consistent with our previous findings on fishery workers, hunters, trampers, and also for lifestyle workers. So the results really showed uh, MND risk was associated with a certain occupational exposures in New Zealand. There are some strengths and the limitations of the study. The first used the national minimum data set and Motor New Disease Association region, um, Registry and the New Zealand Electoral is a uh, significant strength to identify the case and controls. In particular, the MND ACE register and national mineral data site provide a reliable source for all the MND case in New Zealand. And the New Zealand Electoral representative, the generations which um, generated the disease. The second strength of the study is the misclassification of the case status was minimized. This is because all the case was diagnosed with MND by a neurologist, and all the diagnosis details and neurologist contact details was provided by all the case before they come to the interview. And the third strength of the study is the lifestyle lifetime occupational history was collected. This is in advantage compared with the studies based on the metallic data or based on the sensor data, which they only collect one or two drops. And another strength of the study is both case and control answer the questionnaire without use proxy, which is advantage compared with the study based on the metallic data. And the study is a relative um, large size compared with the study, a case control study based on the occupations. And the limitation of the study is recall bias. It is um, 
the main limitation for all the case control studies. To minimize the, lim the limitation of the recall bias, we sent the detailed questionnaires a few weeks before the interview to each participant to allow them to have sufficient time to think through the life histories and to answer the question. And we also used a detailed and logical questionnaire rather than just yes and no answer. But however, we still need to interpret the study result cautiously because there is lack of direct exposure measurement. So the further analysis, we will focus on the specific exposures related to the specific job task. And also, we will focus on the dose-response relationship. We will apply job exposure matrix on agricultural chemicals, fumigant, and solvent. And it's our hope that study result can contribute a better understanding of the disease in New Zealand. And if we can apply the result into the practice, into the workplace, try to reduce the exposures, we may can help to reduce, to develop the diseases later on. And thank you for everybody. Thank you, Grace. I think that really um, brings into play the, the understanding we're trying to gather around our high rates of motor neuron disease in New Zealand and what that pertains to. So it's my pleasure next to introduce Professor Martin Turner, who is a professor of clinical neurology and neuroscience at Oxford University uh, at the Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences. He is honorary consultant neurologist to the John Radcliffe Hospital and co-director of the Oxford MND Clinic. He's a pioneer and world leader in the field of ALS biomarkers. And indeed, he's here with us today to present his talk on the importance of biomarkers. Thank you. Thanks very much to uh, the organizers uh, for the invitation. So with a bit of luck, uh, this will, which one do you press to move it on? The big green one. Great, so I was last here as a medical student uh, doing really daft things like this um, uh, over Nelson. Uh, thanks to a technical failure, I'm not able to show you the video of my bungee jump dunking me in the shot over river, um, but uh, I've become much more conservative since that time. Uh, my disclosures um, are as follows. Uh, the material ones are really the last two. Um, we had some kits given to us uh, just in kind by a, a company uh, for neurofilament, which I'll mention later, and also I'm on the scientific advisory board for Orphazyme. So the key areas that um, I think that the barriers to trials development in, in ALS are that we really have a problem with getting patients into trials at an early stage, and the disease is very established by the time they get into those studies. We also have this problem that we've already had highlighted that the variable prognosis of patients um, means that we put everybody into the same trial, we lump them together, and that's a problem. Uh, we also find that we would find it very difficult if I give you a drug, if I give a patient a drug, how are they going to know if it's made them better? It's very unlikely that they'll feel better the next day, um, and at some point they're going to have to decide whether they're getting uh, worse, less uh, speedily than they were before they took the drug, and measuring that is extremely difficult. Um, and the other aspect that I'll touch on at the end is who's at risk of this condition? Because until we know beyond the monogenetic cases, until we know who's actually at risk, it's going to be very hard for us to start to prevent the condition. Now, one of the problems with the diagnostic issue is it's all very well to say that we could have a test that we could give a, a physician to make the diagnosis of MND, but that's only as good as the person who's going to use that test. So when somebody, um, a person uh, living with ALS develops the condition, they're not going to think there's anything wrong for quite some time. And that area, you know, they're not going to think, I better just quickly do the test for ALS, MND. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. So actually the time to really intervene is where they go to a primary care physician and to make sure that that person sends them on to a neurologist and not a spinal surgeon or ENT if they have bulbar problems. So that kind of area is actually about education. And it's not really feasible at the moment to think about putting a diagnostic test into the hands of a primary care physician who will see one case of ALS MND in their life. Where we can intervene is making sure that the neurologist who sees them 
maybe does have a test. But for most cases of MND, uh, when they present to a neurologist, it's going to take about 10 minutes to make the diagnosis um, uh, in terms of uh, securing it in their mind. And it's going to take, unfortunately, an average of a year for that person to get to a neurologist. This diagram here is very old and, and sh shows you really that people have been thinking about these things for a long time. We've been told it's a spectrum of upper and lower motor neuron involvement and most cases that Charcot described have a bit of both. The disease gets slower as you come out to the edges here. Um, and so this mixture in the middle is where we're seeing most of our cases. And actually the cases that, that give us the most difficulty in clinic are people who have either upper or lower motor neuron involvement predominantly or just one limb involved and the slower cases. That's where we'd really, really find it helpful to have a diagnostic biomarker. I sort of think of it as a, a condition really that's circling um, and getting ever faster really as we get into this central area of this black hole where we link up the lower motor neuron PMA type patients, upper motor neuron PLS. These are the extremes and even FTD can be seen as an extreme and all of these are moving re very slowly around the edges if they're far enough out from the critical centre. This is a 10 to 15 year process, this is 20 years, may not even affect survival as you heard in PLS cases. And FTD in its pure form is a 10 year disease. But as soon as these start to get pulled in together, then you start to accelerate and the most dreadful forms really are where you have a mixture of both and that may be a six month process. We've heard a little bit about prognosis varying. Uh, these are the graphs that Heng Yang Westerning uh, put together from many, many observations. And we can see that here's a typical Lou Gehrig's type of patient um, on a very standard trajectory, and then someone like Stephen Hawking uh, out in, in the edge. And although the, the ALS FRS is certainly not ideal, um, it contains some nonlinear components, um, it's reasonable in the clinic. To, uh, to make the clinical observation that our patients, we, we tell our patients if their disease is slow, it will stay slow. That's a very ancient observation. In general, if it's fast, it won't slow down. Now, there are, of course, um, uh, variations around those edges, but that is not a bad um, a description of how ALS works for different people. It's very much defined by somebody's internal architecture whether it be their, their neuronal networks or their cellular components. And the ALSFRS reflects that to some extent, and you can see that patients tend to stay at the same sort of rate. Some of the more aggressive disease may actually change a bit more. We do our trials at the moment in two ways, and then neither of them are very efficient. We can do a survival trial, give a drug and a placebo, and see um, the survival after 18 months. That's a very lengthy trial. It's a very blunt outcome. We can do a study looking at the ALS FRS. This is from the PROACT database, showing all these people varying at different rates, someone going very slowly here, people going very fast here. And we can see if the drug moves the overall mean uh, rate of decline um, upwards or, or, or less. Um, and that's going to take at least 12 months. Has been, uh, drugs have been licensed on six months, but I think most of us feel that that's an inadequate length of time. So a person living with ALS in an average disease course will get into one trial, um, and I think that's unacceptable. These are all the things that we've tried. Don't need to read them all, but there's different kind of strategies, um, uh, and we've had two drugs which have a, a result, one of them on survival, really result, that was the 18-month study, and a Daravone on ALS FRS change. Now, our patients try a lot more things. I think they're just being more honest with us now about telling us what uh, they're taking. And I personally want to support people um, who want to try things, but I want to do that in a way that I feel is safe and feel is ethical personally. Um, and this has become very politicized. The right to try movement is a very nice catchphrase, but actually has some concerns and flaws in that uh, very well-meaning concept. And we're very lucky to have colleagues like Rick Beglack who help patients navigate new treatments through this uh, uh, series called ALS Untangled, which many clinicians contribute to, taking new ideas and getting patients to, um, uh, and, and having a look at those technologies and, and appraising them. The point is that I think we have to have markers um, that will measure change, probably above every, every other aspect of, of our sort of efforts at the moment, because understanding the disease at the cellular level is of course important, but it's gonna to have to be something that we can measure. 
And that might not be a simple uh, thing. We might not simply measure one pathway in a cell and say, well, that's the cause of ALS. I think it's very unlikely. So we want to get people in earlier. We want to, the lower motor neuron cases, probably because they're the, the uh, more common extreme group. We want to get them into trials uh, more confidently. We want to know who's moving fast and slow. And we want to predict things like cognitive involvement. Um, and then finally, we want uh, much, uh, things that are much more sensitive to change. So we can decide if something's not working within maybe three months rather than uh, waiting 12. So what do we need? Something that picks up upper motor neuron involvement, something that detects uh, regionally limited cases um, and in pre-symptomatic, I'll mention at the end, we want to define the rate of progression and the regional extent, and then something that individualizes disease activity for a person. Now, I think that a lot of what we do in biomarkers is, is, has actually revealed a lot of mechanisms, and that's a very important aspect of this. So when we're doing biomarker work, particularly in small um, studies, um, uh, more experimental medicine type of approaches, we're actually looking at key pathways. So I have some value, particularly uh, another reason to put biomarkers in clinical trials, it tells you something about mechanisms, as well as those larger goals that I mentioned before. And we know there's a huge amount going on in these diseases uh, within the nucleus of motor neurons um, or uh, the top end within the cell body, uh, various mechanisms you'll have heard of before. Nucleocytoplasmic transport is a fairly recent one. RNA processing in recent years and axonal transport. These are extremely long neurons. But actually, it's, it's also the support cells that are particularly important and, and exciting the nerves and also coming in to perhaps clear up or perhaps making the situation worse. And it's entirely possible, uh, we've already heard that motor neuron disease is not one disease. Uh, it may actually also not actually be anything to do with the motor neuron in terms of how it starts. So it may be, turn out to be the, the most wrongly named condition ever. Um, but it's an example really where we're starting to think much more broadly uh, and not necessarily going after the simple motor circuit which personally, in my view, is probably one of the most resilient in evolutionary terms. Um, and it may actually be all the extra packing that has gone around it uh, in the complexity of becoming human beings. So we've got biomarkers that can look at a large part of the system. And I think this is a system disorder. I prefer that term really to, uh, to networks because, of course, a network is a net and, and there's a net of neurons throughout your body. What I think we mean by network disorder is, is where it's beyond the simple anatomical uh, connections. This is not simply A connects to B, um, so uh, damaged by the postal system, as it were. This is perhaps damaged by telephone connection. So why are certain areas connecting to each other which don't apparently have a simple anatomical connection? So we can use brain scanning for that. We can use um, transcranial magnetic stimulation to look at the central pathways. We can look downstream. I won't talk a lot about that, but uh, to look at the muscles. Um, and then we can get onto the fluids, um, spinal fluid, blood, and urine. Now, I think you know, what's made a difference from my point of view was uh, starting to do this systematically in patients and to do it longitudinally. It's very, very challenging, but uh, um, patients are up for it. And it's down to us to make that happen. And it's simple things like, can you get someone in and out of a scanner safely um, and, and get round somebody um, uh, in position for a spinal tap? It's certainly not, never been lack of patient volunteering or willingness to do things. I think what's made a huge difference is that MRI is no longer photography. Most radiologists see it as that. They'll see it as uh, taking a picture of the brain, um, but in fact, um, it's about much, much more. And if you just look at this normal classical MRI scan of someone with ALS, it looks the same. It looks normal. In fact, the only real MRI scan difference that you'll see is on a PLS patient, and there you will see some atrophy of the motor cortex, but it's, it's not seen in typical MND. But we can go into the data much more and look at the brain at, at a much more mathematical level and look at structure by uh, mathematically segmenting out the cortex. This is the ribbon of cortex around the brain. Uh, we can also look at the directionality of water in white matter tracts. These are large tracts. So it's moving relatively freely here in spinal fluid. It's moving in a much more restricted way through this pathway. And then these sorts of tools um, do start to tap into network function. We can look at the coincident signal of areas of the brain, um, in this case to do with blood flow, something called BOLD. Um, but it's really tapping into the idea that it's not really that 
this part here is connecting anatomically to this part, but they simultaneously fire. And why do they simultaneously fire? And then if you look in a different way, they're firing in a different network pattern. And these, um, uh, this type of brain function, I think, is, is something that transcends anything that we've previously thought of in terms of um, imaging. But what about the simple anatomy and the structure? Well, the basic structure um, in ALS MND tends to involve this motor pathway coming down from the corticospinal tract through the corpus callosum. And this is just put alongside these original pictures here from uh, post-mortem uh, work that was done uh, 70 years ago now, I'll get it, 60 years ago, um, by Marion Smith, showing you really we're doing this now in vivo. The difficulty and the challenge we have at the moment is a lot of these neuroimaging techniques are done at the group level. So we, we can make inferences from groups of about 10 patients, but it's hard to get it down to the individual. <laughs> And what I'll probably uh, sort of predict there is that will come really with mixing and, and combining uh, various modalities. If we look baseline in a sort of diagnostic way at the white matter tract changes, there's a lot of damage at baseline, and that is a big problem. And this patient, you know, this group of patients, they may, some of them may well have unilateral single limb involvement, and yet they've got widespread brain damage. And it's telling us, if we didn't realize, that there's a huge redundancy in the brain. And by the time you get to symptoms, there's a lot of damage. This may have some value diagnostically, particularly in lower motor neuron cases. In follow-up, in, in our hands, we tend to see a lot more tangible grey matter change as, as extra motor involvement proceeds, even if the patient doesn't have that overtly in cognitive dysfunction. And so that might have more of a, a role in following the patient up in terms of things that are changing. We can detect um, central nervous system involvement in patients with lower motor neuron disease. This is a nice study looking at a large group of patients, so that would have some diagnostic value there. And we can detect... Um, extra motor uh, cognitive change, uh, again, that, that and aspect that Orla mentioned, a very important part of the overall disease. We can start to find um, uh, correlates of that in the imaging. If we just ask a computer to take those uh, network signals, the resting state signals, and just separate individuals from uh, healthy people, we can start to think about uh, uh, diagnostics in terms of brain activity or physiological patterns um, across the brain. And, and that's something that's very exciting and I think, again, um, may well be the future. Now, we've been using a technique called magnetoencephalography. It's a very easy technique to use. There aren't that many scanners at the moment, but it's actually not a difficult technique for patients. They can be sat up um, and uh, they get sealed in this room. It's extremely sensitive. That image you were seeing there is someone making a decision to make a movement um, and the areas of the brain ramping up, obviously, over a, 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 a drawn out time there, but that's happening over um, very few milliseconds. And we see in this particular area called the beta band of change in activation um, in our patients. And that's changes in the preparation, initiation, and recovery from movement. A huge area that we can tap into, and I guess where we are at the moment, is we need to know exactly which bit of that is the most discriminatory. We can also link that up to the activity at the muscle end, so we get the whole system. And I think that's a really key thing in MND, is to stop uh, thinking of it just as upper or lower motor neurons, but as a system problem. That's just showing you that if you link uh, markers together, you improve the separation of patients and controls here. This is just a, two types of MRI showing uh, in a model of pre- and post-test probability. What you want to do is bend this outwards here, and that's doing that when you combine these two measures. And here, again, separating patients with probable upper motor neuron signs from mimic disorders um, very nicely by combining m markers. Now, if you stimulate the brain with transcranial magnetic stimulation, you activate the inhibitory pathways of the nervous system, which are thought, thought to be um, uh, uh, um, reduced in patients with MND. This is what should happen here. You should get an inhibition at a short paired stimulus interval, but you get a lack of um, inhibition in ALS patients. And you can think of it really like a failure of the braking system. That has a very, very powerful role in diagnostics. These sorts of techniques, which I won't mention a lot, are looking down at the muscle end, counting motor, motor nerve units, um, measuring various aspects of the nerve conduction study, and then it, it, looking at the impedance across the muscles. 
And the graphs are showing that they all are superior to ALS FRS in terms of change. And you'll see these finding their way more into trials as potential markers because um, they're a little bit easier to apply at the moment than, than uh, straightforward imaging. We'd all like something of the key marker of, of ALS. This is something that is a signature of nearly every case. Um, this molecule should normally reside in the nucleus, or at least if it comes out into the cytoplasm, it's very brief and goes back. It shouldn't be hanging around, and if it does, it tends to aggregate. Now, whether this is a tombstone marker of nerve damage, damage um, or actually, just to throw it out there for Chris, whether it's actually a cell doing the right thing, um, and we're not seeing the ones that, uh, that didn't do this, but whatever, it's a very key marker of this condition. It's a very key pathway. If we could measure that, it would be absolutely ideal. But um, unfortunately, it's very hard to detect. What I want to mention a little bit about is the things we can measure in the blood and spinal fluid. Neurofilaments are the ones I'll concentrate on. These are largely, although it's, it's probably a little more complicated, a, a measure of breakdown in some sense, coming away from um, the building blocks of nerves. So they're released high levels in the spinal fluid, lower levels in the blood. We're getting much better at measuring it in the blood. And that's the way forward, is to do blood tests. There is a urine marker of neurodegeneration. Um, Slightly less separation between patients and, and controls. A um, bit more variable in how it rises over the disease, but again, very accessible, very easy to test in a trial. Here's the picture with neurofilaments, higher levels in the CSF, a little bit more overlap in the blood, but with modern techniques, that is now clear separation. How does it perform in the diagnostics? Very well, actually. One of the problems is we haven't yet done a study where we've really captured the cases that really challenge the, some of the speakers you'll hear today. So we know the cases we find difficult. They are those slower, lower motor neuron predominant, single limb disorders, and not many of those were in this study. But if you look at all other conditions that have some vague uh, peripheral nerve or central nervous system involvement, neurofilaments perform extremely well in separating ALS from those. I suspect that they will still miss some of the more difficult, slower cases. So the diagnostics, I think, is, is um, getting there. High specificity and some lim more limited sensitivity. But the key value of neurofilaments is not to think of this as a marker of neuronal loss. Um, it's a marker of the intensity of the process. So it's not how many neurons you've lost. That's not the level of neurofilaments. It's how fast you're losing them. And once you think of that, and this is, this is HIV dementia, this is ALS, this is CJD, some of the, the three of the most aggressive neuronal loss conditions, and you see that the levels of neurofilament on average are falling as you get down to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, much, much slower diseases. It's still associated with a huge amount of neuronal loss, but it's to do with the rate of loss. And that's very exciting because the rate of loss seems in individuals, these are individual tracks, to be actually pretty stable. This is in blood. And so over time, as we see in the clinic, the patient's rate of change is roughly the same, whether we measure that by LSFRS or just our gestalt, really. And it's staying the same, and it's higher the faster your disease is progressing and lower in slower cases. So that makes it very attractive in a, in a trial because you can, could perhaps have a little bit more heterogeneity. And if your drug is working, the neurofilament level overall should drop. Does it work in other diseases? Well, yes, in MS, when you give fingolimod, a baseline, the neurofilament levels, there's a bit of spread, but um, no difference between placebo and fingolimod. And then the people who've responded in terms of um, uh, function and also MRI scan changes, these are people with MS, um, much lower neurofilament levels. So there is evidence at a disease level in MS. And we heard some very preliminary data in Perth um, suggesting that in people who are responding to some of the therapies Chris Shaw will tell you about, again, um, uh, some level in uh, lowering in neurofilament. I think it's preliminary data, and it was incomplete data. Um, that would really be an absolute final um, demonstration for me, uh, and is not necessarily something I think we have to wait for uh, to move forward. There are other markers, uh, markers of neuroinflammation, those other cells that are coming around the motor neuron, perhaps coming in to clear up, perhaps not being very helpful, perhaps even initiating some of the process, we're not, we're not sure. But some of these markers come out of 
um, uh, studies where we essentially go fishing with a, with a blood sample, uh, a CSF sample, and look at the proteins that come out. And these chitinases are some of the, the new kids on the block, which seem to be raised in ALS, and they come from the macrophage uh, microglial lineage. That's doubly interesting because we can image microglia. Uh, some of the early uh, ligands that I used when I was at King's have been superseded by nicer pictures um, and actually slightly better ligands, um, which also show uh, where the microglia are most involved and not surprisingly in areas that you would expect, motor cortex and in the brainstem. So, Moving towards uh, closing up, I want to talk a little bit about predicting uh, the condition and who's at risk. So we know that the condition starts for patients when they develop symptoms, and about a, a year or so later they might have a diagnosis, and we're going to give our Rilizol at this point here, um, and, and that's going to be a fairly narrow window, really. What we'd really like is to be in this sort of zone where there's a huge amount that's been going on by definition. If we know that some patients have a genetic driver for their condition, um, then they've carried that for 50, 60 years without any symptoms. So there's a huge amount going on to compensate for and to, um, to manage uh, the changes, and that shouldn't be any different for a sporadic patient. We'd like to put our drugs in earlier. And the way that we can, we can tap into this at the moment is to study people who are genetic carriers and say what's going on before you have any symptoms. If you do that in patients with um, C9 ORF, you find there's a huge number of brain changes many, many years. These patients are younger than 40, so at least you would have thought 10 years away from disease, if not more, and lots and lots of changes at a structural level. If you look at those fluctuations in, in the um, uh, resting state networks, you can start to divide out patients here in red. These are affected people. The green people are healthy controls, the same age. And then in the blue dots here, these are people who are genetic carriers who have no symptoms. But you can see that they're not falling so solely within the healthy range, and they're not falling yet solely within the affected range, somewhere in between. And similarly, using the magnetic encephalography, this bilateral activation that we see in patients affected, we start to see similar changes perhaps compensatory changes in people who have a genetic cause but no symptoms. And this will allow us to confidently give the sort of therapies Chris Shaw will tell you about. We're going to need something to give that to somebody for 40 years, and we're going to need some marker that suggests that that's the right thing to do. And that's not going to come in a simple way, and it's very likely to come from looking at brain physiology and how it adapts long before you have symptoms. There are some left field things coming in, which I think is very, very exciting. This was a GP study with blood samples that were taken routinely from people, 6 million people, I think 600 of whom went on to get ALS. So you can look back over 20 years, and you can see that the ALS group, they weren't known to have ALS at that time, and it wasn't, it wasn't clear that they were going to get it, but they, they'd separated already in, in something very simple, their LDL-HDL ratio. Um, and actually some more uh, unusual markers, lipoprotein markers. So again, perhaps surrogates for uh, changes that are happening at a cellular level, some compensatory changes. These are the sorts of things we're going to have to be much more open to looking at, not going after the markers like neurofilaments in the pre-symptomatic stage. They won't be there because the neuronal loss hasn't started at a higher enough rate. We're looking at things that are, are at the moment seem totally unexpected. And metabolic changes are, I think, something that have started to come to the fore. We can see changes in the size of the hypothalamus many years before the onset of symptoms. We have this whole uh, ideas. I think many of us have been thinking about this for a long time, about exercise, athleticism, um, fitness in general. Um, and rather than being causative, maybe these are markers of the type of people who are more at risk. It's, it's a great thing to be fit and healthy, but it may be the sort of neuronal architecture, the sort of neuronal physiology that allows MND to take hold more easily if other things happen. So it may not be that it's caused the condition. It may simply be it creates the right environment in a few people who've developed other problems. So I think this is how it maps out. There's the disability rising, as we can see, um, in the clinical disease. Early on, I think there will be biomarkers of altered cellular metabolism and how that compensates. 
I think there will be functional brain changes, probably some of the earliest things we can pick up. And probably then behavioural and cognitive impairments, we're already realising there's a lot of that going on before the onset of symptoms. Um, how you define what's normal, very, very challenging. I've noticed many patient, many spouses and family members of particularly C9 patients will tell me they've always been a bit of a joker, they've always been a bit like this, um, and particularly if they've got FTD. So where, you know, being a bit of a joker, making puns, um, becomes actually abnormal, extremely difficult. Um, but I'm sure that there are changes that are occurring over time. Structural MRI change is probably quite late in the day, um, uh, but that may improve with sensitivity. Neurofilaments, we know they go up just shortly, six to 12 months before the onset of symptoms. Very helpful in the symptomatic phase, probably helpful for early administration of some of these new genetic drugs, but I think not what we should be focusing on for the decades before. So to summarise, Walter Bradley put a paper out 20 years ago saying that we should think about biomarkers because they were essential components. And when I started 10 years ago, we could see that there was a huge number of possibilities from MRI, from blood, from CSF, but it was all a bit of a mess. Lots of 10 patients and 10 controls. This goes up, this goes down. Nothing really um, systematic. And I think what we felt we should be doing is these prospective multi-centre cohort analyses that have now been happening for the last 10 years. And I think that's what's made a big difference. Um, and then the Sheffield group have recently summarised things again, and I agree, suggesting that maybe, maybe now the answer is to combine markers together. We've got this um, uh, initiative across the UK in three centres that the M&D Association uh, funded through the Ice Bucket Challenge, which was to systematically collect samples in the clinic. Here's a much younger version of me. It's weird, someone told me actually, that looks so young, but to me it just looks like I look now. Um, but um, I'm the guy on the right, by the way. Uh, so uh, the, the idea is that, um, uh, that y y we can get samples from every patient in the clinic, whatever they feel they can give us. And they, you know, you know, telling patients what they think, it's very clear to me that that people living with ALS want to do this. They want to take part and contribute. And actually, again, it comes down to us to make this happen. It is very logistically uh, challenging. It requires a lot of personnel, um, but you can do it. Uh, and I think it's the way we have to move. We can't really always bring people back and do separate uh, studies and days. We want to do this joined up in the clinic when we see them. So last slide, uh, new cancer style trials era. I think immediately we should be starting to test some of these biofluid biomarkers in the clinic. Blood neurofilament um, is possible to do without really expensive equipment and is reasonable to get started on that to see how well it works at the individual level. Um, I think that we as, as uh, clinicians, uh, academic clinicians, should be uh, insisting that biomarkers are part of trials um, so that we know if drugs don't work in the future why they didn't work. In the short term, I think we'll see biomarkers in supporting the sort of frameworks you'll hear from Angela later. And I'm very excited about, you know, there are 100 drugs out there at phase two level or repurposed drugs. These are things that are licensed for other conditions, whatever. Um, we know that they're safe and they're ready to be tried in ALS. Now, we know that we can't try every drug on every patient. So we need something that will allow us to triage those. I think it's very reasonable to take small groups of patients and triage, repurpose, license, safe drugs to triage those with neurofilament. The worst that would happen is we throw out an amazing drug for ALS because it wasn't good enough at the neurofilament level. But if it allowed us to triage the best candidates and put those into a proper study, a platform trial, that's a perfectly reasonable strategy, I think. The alternative is we've got this huge pile and we don't know where to start. In the medium term, every patient getting into a trial, and that's, you know, obviously I hope that in the short term the condition's solved, but we have to think uh, in a more um, uh, long-term way, and I think every person should be saying, as they say to me in a study, you know, you, you give me some very difficult news, so what's the trial? And I say, you know, we don't have one recruiting at the moment. That is unacceptable. I go home feeling dreadful every Monday because of that. So every person gets into a trial, I think we'll have a TDP43 biomarker. Actually, I think that may come from PET. Um, we've got uh, uh, some nice work um, looking at a, a unique peptide that we may be able to raise an antibody to, so we'll see. In the longer term, biomarkers defining who the larger at-risk group is. 
You know, I should have put a patent down on the word synaptogram because that's the sort of thing that you'll be having when, when you're about sort of uh, 40. Uh, you'll have a synaptogram which will start to suggest whether your networks are coming to pieces both at a structural and a functional level. And there'll be, there'll be other tests that will point you in the direction of which particular networks are degenerating. And they're the people that we'll be targeting. Um, and that, that'll be the future. It'll be a preventative strategy. Just want to thank the people that make it all happen. Um, as you heard earlier, multidisciplinary care is probably the single most important thing that we've done in terms of patient survival and quality of life. Um, and I think that all of the clinical research has come from that. And if we don't offer uh, that sort of care, then for all sorts of reasons, we can't take the clinical research forward. So it needs a really great team in the clinic, and my co-colleague Kevin Talbot in particular, um, and our specialist nurse consultant, uh, Rachel Marsden. And then for me, it involves a lot of research fellows, some very talented postdoctoral scientists, and uh, of course, some collaborations more widely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Turner, for a fascinating and uh, informative talk. Um, I mean, we in New Zealand certainly have a lot of people here wanting to take part in clinical trials, and we're, you know, we're looking forward to the day when that will come. And I know Emma will probably touch on a bit that later. So before we break for morning tea, um, I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge two people who've had a long association with MND New Zealand, both avid supporters of MND research, and recently, we awarded um, Beth Watson and Dr. Andrew Chancellor life memberships of MND New Zealand. And since they're both with us today, I'd like to take the opportunity to present them with their life membership certificates. So Beth and Dr. Chancellor, if you could come up to the stage, please. So Beth has worked with MND New Zealand since 2001, starting as National Executive Officer in 2007. Beth joined the National Council where she served as President for 11 years until retiring from council at this year's AGM. Beth was instrumental in securing a disability information advisory services contract with the Ministry of Health, the creation of the New Zealand MND registry, and establishing the very successful annual walk to defeat MND events. Dr. Andrew Chancellor is a well-respected consultant neurologist with the Bay of Plenty District Health Board. Among his many achievements, Dr. Chancellor undertook a research doctorate at Edinburgh University, and the outcome was the initial work which established the Scottish Motor Neuron Disease Register. Dr. Chancellor recently stepped down as Honorary Medical Advisor for MND New Zealand after 25 years in the role, and his advice and insight has been hugely appreciated by the New Zealand MND community. So on behalf of everyone at MND New Zealand and from the MND community, I'd like to thank both Beth and Dr. Chancellor for their commitment in improving the lives of people living with MND and welcome them both as life members. If you'd like to say a few words. Thank you very much. It's Carl, isn't it? Carl. Yeah, thank you very much, Carl. Um, can I introduce uh, Dr. James Cleland, um, who's my colleague, neurologist in Tauranga, who's kindly accepted the role of medical advisor to Motor Disease Association. Um, and so I look forward to, to his involvement. Thank you for the certificate. Thank you. <laughs> you know <laughs> There's no show without Punch wanting to say something. It's been just such an enormous privilege to have served motor neuron, or people with motor neuron disease, really. And, and I'm sitting at the back there just so excited listening to the speakers here today. So very seldom, I've been so lucky in my life to have had this chance to try and help make things better for people with motor neuron disease. And it's just so wonderful to have here today international researchers talking about real hope. You know, let's hope we see some, some change. So. Thank you to people with motor neuron disease for giving this, me this amazing opportunity. I'm going to present to you a little bit of specific work that we do, um, but in the interests of uh, keeping it very broad and um, giving a real introduction to a flavour for research uh, across what, what we're doing, um, I'll also try to put our research into perspective um, and present to you the nature of our research, which is to act more of a, a hub 
promoting your own disease research in New Zealand, um, connecting out to other research groups, but also um, being kind of the core where most of the activity is happening. So I hope I can achieve that goal of showing you a broad overview of what we do, but also get into some nitty gritty and specifics for those who um, come along for the ride. So here's a picture, I show this slide at um, many different meetings now, but this um, is the way I think of the research infrastructure we currently have in place to do motor neuron disease research in New Zealand. So we have, um, I'll come back to the brain and biobanks because most of my talk will, will pertain to those, but you've heard a little bit about the patient registry and uh, uh, Zara, is that right, Zara? Sorry, she's new and I'm not good with names. Um, <laughs> Now we'll talk about the patient registry, which has been going now for a couple of years and um, I think is really going to underpin a lot of what we are able to do with research. Um, I'll talk also about the National MND Genetic Study that my team is running. And um, really without Lydia, who's the manager of our motor neuron disease research network, uh, together with Claire, this meeting wouldn't have happened. So it's really a goal of the research network that groups with an MND research interest across New Zealand connect with one another. And this is really the ultimate um, example of a face-to-face -face or a kanohi ki te kanohi. And um, I think with, together all these infrastructures, these building blocks are going to set the scene for us to um, approach the kind of amazing work that's being done internationally by the speakers that we've heard already and who we'll hear more from. But today I'm going to mostly focus on um, what we do with human brain cells and human brain tissues. And I've just seen my um, esteemed colleague, Mike Dragunov, come in at the back of the room. He's the director of the Biobank, and some of the work I'll talk about um, is under Mike's directorship. So he's an important player in this as well. First of all, just a little introduction to the Centre for Brain Research, which is where this kind of hub for MND research is happening. Um, and although we actually spread across a number of campuses and comprise 80 or more research groups um, and led by uh, Professor Sir Richard Fall, the main um, MND research at the moment is being conducted just opposite the hospital, which gives us a really uh, great location from which to conduct work with patients and, um, and with brain tissue as well, which um, comes sometimes under the tunnel, literally under the road, we're, we're connected to these two sites. So there's a real focus on uh, the clinical and translational uh, relevance of what we do. This is the team. Hopefully, um, I can see some of them in the back there. Hopefully, you'll get a chance to meet some of them and ask any questions you have uh, pertaining to the specifics of what we do. But I have a very committed and lovely research team, and we really span the range right from looking at cells in a dish to brain tissues, um, genetics and symptoms of people living with disease and engaging with the community. And as Richard said, you know, we're not the CIA. We don't try to keep it a secret what we do. We want people to know. So first of all, um, I, I worked with Chris Shaw in, at King's College in London for four years. And I came back in 2000, uh, end of 2013, early 2014, to New Zealand. And I knew that people in New Zealand had motor neuron disease, but it was really unclear to me who had the disease and how many people and just how to start tackling this disease to get ourselves in a position of understanding motor neuron disease in New Zealand in the same way as it's understood elsewhere. So despite being a cell biologist, I knew it was really important that we start to look at who actually has this disease. So um, one of my students who's here today, Maisie Cow, ran this study using mortality data, so national death certificate data, to understand just how many people have died from motor neuron disease um, over the last wee while. So we knew from previous literature that, well, we had heard from previous literature that there was a, a high and increasing incidence of motor neuron disease in some regions. So this study was specific to the Canterbury region. And it was, you know, really a quite astounding finding that our rates were the very highest in the world and in fact were increasing, really going off the charts. So did this apply just to Christchurch or was this a national phenomenon? I wanted to know. We, we both wanted to know, Maisie and I. So she examined um, around 20 years worth of data, 2,000 deaths from motor neuron disease. Um, and this is the biggest data set that we could really collect at this time. And we're looking to look at incidence data from this point, but uh, you know, this is the best we have for now. What we found, astonishingly, is that our rates are not increasing. It's somewhat reassuring, actually. If we account for the fact that New Zealanders are aging, we, all populations around the world um, are aging, and if we account for that, remove that ageing factor, our rates aren't increasing. 
But what we did find is that our rates are high compared to elsewhere. We took uh, the raw data from lots of other studies and uh, processed them in the same way as our data to make them strictly comparable. In fact, um, I think Orla gave us some data from her studies. And we found that New Zealand is right up there with other um, European uh, populations and having very high rates of motor neuron disease. Perhaps Grace's study has explained to us a little bit about the environmental factors um, involved there. We're very interested also in the genetic propensity for New Zealanders to develop disease. So this got a bit of media attention, um, perhaps not quite the attention I was expecting. Um, you know, th these were some really uh, striking headlines. Uh, this was a bit painful, <laughs> uh, kind of, why don't you know? Um, I felt rather seen by this one, but um, it was very reassuring that then another a global burden of disease study, which is a, a very big kind of epidemiological study, um, also using mortality data, reconfirmed our findings that New Zealand had, had really high rates of motor neuron disease. Um, what was a little bit unfortunate is, again, the news media got hold of this, and um, we're really interested in the fact that New Zealand's deaths compare quite um, quite well. Well, uh, you know, it's not on the, on the right side of the numbers, but New Zealand uh, mortality from motor neuron disease is very similar to those of comparable health systems. So in a health system where a person with motor neuron disease can come and be appropriately diagnosed, they have good access to that health care and to that ascertainment, um, the, the rates will be roughly the same. But there are other countries in the world where that's not true, where access to neurology is poorer. Um, we all these studies account for ageing, so even if the population is younger, we, we kind of artificially age them, so that's, that's not a major problem, but it's the access to good neurological diagnosis that's different across the world. Um, and so what you see is that the global rates are very low because of this uh, disparity. But of course, the New Zealand news media took this and said we have a rate that's five times the global average. Um, I don't want you to take that message away because that's not right. Um, if we were looking at comparable health systems, the New Zealand rates are high, but they um, are within the realms of reason. So the next study we did was start to look, OK, if our rates are, um, are similar to those in comparable health systems, do our genetics and neuropathology of disease look similar to what is known elsewhere? So that is, are the causes of disease in New Zealand the same as elsewhere, um, genetically? And if you look at the brain tissue of people who have died from this disease, do their brains look any different? Um, and the spoiler and probably rather obvious uh, result was that no, our motor neuron disease is not very different in New Zealand. But this was a foundation from which we can start to build um, and do more studies. So the New Zealand Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank has been banking, banking brains under Richard's, uh, Sir Richard Fall's custodianship for over 20 years, must be 25 years now, 1994, 95? 40 years. Right, so the, the actual establishment of the bank seems, you know, it's very recent in the history of the brain bank compared to how long Richard's been doing this. But, you know, we've collected these brains from people, um, from families with motor neuron disease, and our first look at uh, characterising those brains showed us that, indeed, these have the same clumping and aggregation of the molecule TDP43 as are seen in brains in every other part of the world. Um, we Most of our cases had no family history, but the number of people with a family history was pretty similar to what we would expect elsewhere. Um, perhaps a bit high, actually, because families are really motivated to donate brain tissue to our bank. Um, and we did find... Sorry... We did find um, pe people with the C9 or 72 mutation, and they had a really interesting, um, but other, also already known, uh, pathological signature of other clumps aside from just TDP43 in their brain. Um, probably of interest more to the um, international members of the delegation. We also have uh, families that have VCP mutations, ubiquitin 2 mutations, SOD1 mutations. So our genetics and neuropathology doesn't look different, but we really needed to do this study to, um, to go forward and start to ask more, um, more detailed questions about disease. So one of these is, is this really just a motor neuron disease? I think Martin really touched on this nicely. Um, and 
This part of the, the slide will really speak to what Emma tells us about later. So we know that this is a disease where genetic risk and environmental risk come together and tends to manifest as the accumulation of disease proteins like the clumps of TDP43, clumps of SOD, clumps of these dipeptide repeats. And um, whether it's the clumping process or the clumps themselves or um, their sequestration of other molecules, that leads to motor neuron death. But is that really all there is to this picture? There's also uh, glial cells. Um, I haven't even shown oligodendrocytes and um, other players in this, but the major cell types you might all have heard of that are in the brain along with the neurons are astrocytes and microglia. These well, used to be thought of as the glue of the brain, but really these are uh, very important functional molecules that do their own signaling and have their own roles, and they also support the health and functioning of motor neurons. And we know that these also occasionally have clumps of these aggregating proteins. Um, ordinarily, it's the motor neurons who have a really striking uh, loss in the disease, and they have these striking um, aggregates or clumps, but we also see it in the uh, supporting brain cells. What's being increasingly recognised and what my group focuses on is what is the role of the vasculature, so the blood vessels that um, send molecules, nutrients, um, allow the regulated exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, how is that vasculature affected in disease? We know that it's really important for the blood vessels in your brain to deliver uh, nutrients and also to take away waste, but there has to be a really regulated process. We have cell types called pericytes, and there's also a kind of matrix of proteins that surround the vessels, and these make sure that uh, blood factors that should be within the vessels and stay within the vessels do, and things that should exchange um, in a regulated way across the vessel wall do. If you have a loss of these uh, pericyte cells, then what happens is you tend to have unregulated leakage across the vessel wall. So parts of the blood that should really stay in the bloodstream are starting to leak into the brain tissue. We call it the parenchyma, it's the meat of the brain. And that is a problem because the motor neurons can be vulnerable, that can act as an irritant uh, to motor neurons that already have issues. So a study that we um, have conducted recently was basically trying to map the leakage of that um, leakage of those blood factors into the brain tissue or meat against the uh, motor neuron death that we know happens. So there's been a few really beautiful studies mapping across the spinal cord where motor neurons are lost. So you might know that the cervical part of your spinal cord, which is um, at the level of your arms, uh, sends lower motor neurons out to the muscles of your arms, and then the, the lumbar part of your cord sends uh, motor neurons out to your, the muscles of your limbs. So that's where the major motor neuron degeneration happens, the lower motor neuron degeneration. And our colleagues have shown that um, these parts of the cord where motor neurons die are also, um, this, so this yellow and red um, labels here. This is the hotspot for motor neuron death. And these are also hotspots for where TDP43 protein clumps. So there's a relationship there between clumping of this TDP protein and loss of neurons. But is there also a relationship to the leakage of factors across the vessel wall? That's what we wanted to know. Because previously it had only been shown that the leakage was happening at the cervical region of the cord. No one had really looked in these kind of cool spots at whether the same thing was happening, whether this uh, red haemoglobin molecule that should be uh, solely contained within the vessels and is shown to leak out. Does that only happen here where motor neurons are lost, or does it also happen here where motor neurons are, are relatively spared? So we first mapped. Um, in the same way that our colleagues had done, we mapped TDP43 protein clumps and motor neuron loss across the cord. Um, not surprisingly, we see that in controls, there's very little sign of a, a pathological clumping of TDP, but in cases, there's a lot more. We quantify this with a, an automated system. And then when we map this across the cord, there's a very slight um, tendency for the cervical part of the cord, C8, and the lumbar part of the cord, so the arm part of the cord and the leg part of the cord, to have a bit more TDP. It's really a quite subtle, um, subtle shift. But what's really interesting is that the leakage of these blood factors out into the meat of the spinal cord does not fit that pattern at all. Um, if anything, it's the complete inverse. So we do see more leakage in, that, in the ALS cases, but this is controls here in our ALS. It's so actually the pattern shows that in the middle part of the spinal cord that's not innovating the arms or legs, where we didn't have as much motion neuron loss, we didn't have as much TDP43 clumping, that's where we're seeing this pattern of leakage out into the tissue of the spinal cord. This is just a zoom of that. 
where the haemoglobin should be um, fully contained within the vessel walls, but we see it leaking out, kind of radiating out from the vessels. But that really is not fitting the same pattern as the motor neuron loss, which begs the question, uh, which comes first? Is it relevant? Is this just a late feature of disease? Um, and is it a pathological target, or a, a target for therapy, rather? So to kind of support this line of questioning, um, and also to ask the question of what the, the pericytes are doing, which are the, those cells that were really reinforcing the barrier, we actually grow pericytes from people who've died from motor neuron disease. We grow them in a dish. Someone who's died from the disease and we've um, had their brain donated to us, you would think that those cells could no longer survive, but actually we can culture them in the dish, meaning we can put them in a dish and they'll grow and divide and we can study them. It's quite amazing and really um, quite a privilege to work with this kind of um, model. And this just briefly shows that we can um, cut up the tissue and digest it with enzymes, um, leave it spinning and rotating for a time, filter out the parts that, um, that we won't grow, and then we, we grow them in a, a little flask like this. We can come and visit it each day and check how the cells are going, look at it down the microscope. We can also grow other cell types. Um, we can grow the pericytes, as I've said. We can also take the, the layers of protective coating from off the brain and dissect them into small clumps and have them growing in the dish. Those are the meninges. And occasionally we get microglia, which is the inflammatory... Um, uh, kind of clean up molecules of, this, of the brain. So now we're going to get into the, the tricky science part. So come along with me if you can. Have some water and maybe a breather if you can't. So these pericyte cells, we know that they um, are not only important in uh, maintaining the barrier between the blood vessel components and the, the meat of the brain and the meat of the spinal cord. They're also involved in neuroinflammation. They send out little molecules, we call them cytokines, to um, tell the rest of the brain what the inflammatory position of the brain is. And this can regulate the activity of neurons also. And one of the major chemicals that these pericyte cells send out is a chemical called interleukin-6. The, the jury is kind of out about whether this is a bad thing to be floating around the brain or a good thing. So it probably depends on the amount of the interleukin-6 and the context for interleukin-6. But what we do know is that pericytes just absolutely pump it out. So this is pericytes that we've uh, stimulated, and they're just um, pouring out buckets and buckets of the stuff that we can measure from off of them. What's really interesting is that this molecule is regulated by our key disease protein, TDP43. So we know that the clumps of TDP43 in the motor neuron disease brain are probably meaning that the TDP43 doesn't work very well. So the expectation is that this interleukin-6 molecule will not be found at the, the correct levels. Um, and some others have shown that if you take a mouse and you remove the TDP43 from the mouse, um, this is the levels of the TDP43, so they've removed it, um, also the levels of this interleukin-6 molecule are down. They're not able to appropriately make that molecule without TDP. And we're really getting nitty-gritty here now, but we can show the same thing happens in pericytes. We remove the TDP43 from the pericytes. This is um, showing that the TDP43 has gone down. And um, in the situation where we have no TDP, that's the white box, you can see that levels of interleukin-6 are down. So we need TDP43 to be functional to have one of these key um, immune molecules secreted by pericytes. And we can show that that is true for uh, lots of different ways to force the cells to make interleukin-6. So we know that pericytes um, need functional TDP43 to function well. Whether or not they have functional TDP43 is the um, question for our ongoing studies. Um, and I won't go into this too much because the little ding-dong says I shouldn't. Um, but you can talk to my, uh, my student, Charlotte Dunn, who's done some beautiful work looking at whether TDP43 is found at appropriate levels in these cells. I'll just, in the last few minutes, um, I'm probably going to go over, sorry, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about our study to look at MND genetics across the country. And we really don't know what the rates of uh, these, what, what the frequencies of these different gene mutations are in New Zealand, but we can make some predictions based on international data. So we think that if you took around 400 cases at any one time in New Zealand, and you assumed maybe 7.5% of them are familial, it's kind of taking a, a middle road, um, that we might expect around 30 people to have um, a strong gene cause of motor neuron disease. And I've kind of mapped that out here. But the take home of this is not really how many for each. It's more that at the moment our public health, our clinical genetic service will see these people for genetics in clinic. You, if you have a family history of disease, you can go in and ask to know about your genetics and ask to be potentially um, considered in the future for a clinical trial for gene therapy. But you can see the majority of people who have these gene mutations 
do not have a family history, they're sporadic. So we really wanted to, um, to redress this uh, imbalance and make sure that our study recruits not just people with familial disease, but also sporadics. Um, and this is really inspired by Amar's work, saying that you know it's a really fuzzy line between uh, sporadic and familial, and in fact, these terms are somewhat un unhelpful. So this is what the study looks like, just very briefly. Um, some of you in the room might even be involved in the study, so thank you very much. Um, we've had people give blood in their own location, so anywhere in the country that you're located, you can go to your local path lab and give blood. The blood then goes to our collaborators, um, uh, sorry, the blood goes to our, um, our genetic screening facility in, uh, in Canterbury. They extract the DNA. They retain some of the DNA so they can do validation. We're setting up um, capacity within New Zealand to actually do all this, but on a research um, st status, we send the DNA to our collaborators at University of Queensland. So they run huge panels of genes, um, test right across the genome, and they tell us what they think the result might be, and we can validate it back here at home. We're basically setting up the um, ability in future to do this um, within New Zealand, do all of our genetic screening locally, um, paid for by the research dollar. Thanks, public health system. Um, and then we offer uh, participants the option to learn their results. They don't have to, but um, we ensure that we return results in a very supported way uh, through their own neurologist. So in summary, the Centre for Brain Research is becoming a hub for motor neuron disease research in New Zealand, um, and we really want to connect to everybody else who's doing motor neuron disease research and make sure that um, there's the capacity for working together. Uh, we find that the blood spinal cord barrier is leaky in MND, but the relationship between neuron loss and that leakage is, um, is quite uncertain at this time. Certainly, motor neuron disease pericytes in a dish give us a very powerful model to investigate um, the causes of disease, but also for testing therapies. This is a human brain cell growing in a dish. We can test various therapies on these cells and see how, um, how they respond. Um, but what I really want to say is that all of these studies, um, you know, in brains and cells and the genetic studies, are studies with people with MND for people with MND. It's not just us working away in the lab. We, we have you come in, you see what we do, we tell you about it at these kinds of public talks, um, and it's not possible without people being part of our research. So thank you very much for that. And these are all the many, many people that contribute um, and our very generous funders. Thank you. Chris was actually trained in New Zealand. He's a New Zealander by birth um, and has been based in the UK since 1992. Um, he was obviously 12 years old too, Ola. Um, <laughs> prodigy. Um, he's, a, <laughs> he's a professor of neurology and neurogenetics at King's College London, where I had the privilege of working with him. And over the past 25 years, his team have discovered actually quite a number of the gene mutations that cause MND, most notably uh, mutations in the TDP43 gene. And he's also deeply explored the biology of those gene mutations in a huge array of different models. Um, and I think it's really telling that Chris has switched from that really real discovery phase and is making good now on that promise of we need to know more. He's putting it into practice of, um, you know, we've, we've found a lot, now we're going to do something about it. So um, just to say that Professor Shaw will also be your host for this afternoon's session on, no, he won't be, sorry, we've, we've switched Chris out to save his voice. Um, so Amar will be the chair of the afternoon session. But let me, uh, let's all put our hands together to welcome Chris Shaw to the stage. Just to say that uh, this is one of the great moments where being wrong feels so good. Um, so when, uh, Emma is actually the smartest postdoc I've ever had the privilege of working with. And I was very reluctant to see her go back to New Zealand because I feared that there would not be enough support in the community for her research in a relatively uncommon disorder, uh, in an environment in which there isn't often much uh, funding for research. And, you know, sadly, not always as much interest. And I couldn't be more wrong. Look at the people in the room today uh, and the kind of success that she's built up and the team that she's got, which really is, is remarkable. I pointed out to Claire, very clear, that uh, the very first motor neuron disease research meeting in the UK had only 80 people. So you've doubled that. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. 
Um, and it's a great honour to be here as a New Zealander, but also to hear all these excellent talks. And I thought it was fantastic that Orla laid down the gauntlet to New Zealand researchers to say she started with a small island community and has achieved so much uh, and taught us so much about the disease. So that was a really a great privilege. OK, this is me. Um, and I have a few disclaimers. Let's have a look here. I have to figure this out. The big green thing? No, that's the... Hey. So I have a number of collaborations with industry. Uh, I'll complain about those later. Uh, <laughs> but mostly, Evexis and Biogen, Eli Lilly, I've got funding from. I've had funding in the past from GlaxoSmithKline, Vertex, Chronos Therapeutics, and I'm actually on the scientific advisory board of a company called Curalis. Mm -hmm. I received no personal financial gain, but some of these companies have uh, supported work in our laboratory. Uh, I have started up just in the last year, uh, trying to raise funds for a new gene therapy company. It's not because I have ambitions to get a new car, although of course that would be a nice thing. Um, it's because uh, it's very, very difficult to raise sufficient funds from uh, philanthropic uh, grant giving bodies to make these gene therapies, which are enormously expensive, and I'll try and explain that later on. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three disorders. You've heard about ALS, you've heard about frontal dementia. That's probably a bit new. There's another condition called spinal muscular atrophy, which many of you may not know so much about. It's even rarer than motor neuron disease, but it's a childhood form of motor neuron disease, and it's due to a very specific gene defect. These children are born without a specific gene, and they get a really nasty disease. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because it's a motor neuron disease, but also because there are some really remarkable treatments uh, that are now available for it or becoming available for it, although it's problematic. So those are the kinds of things I'm going to discuss. It's going to be a bit of background on the genetics of um, our neuron disease uh, and then where we got to with sort of traditional approaches to small molecule discovery and, and clinical trials and then a focus more on gene therapies. And I'm going to talk about two sorts of gene therapies. One using tiny little molecules of DNA called antisense oligonucleotides and the other is sticking in a big virus that carries a gene that we hope will be beneficial. And I'm going to talk about two of our own programs in that context. OK, so you know as much about ALS as uh, you know many of us in the room. Uh, and in fact, um, I don't need to tell you about the relentless progression of this disorder. But I think one of the statistics that I isn't mentioned very often is it's the most common reason that people seek euthanasia. And my friends in Holland and Belgium, they say about 60% of their patients go through counselling for euthanasia and about 25% die at their doctor's hand. So, you know, I'm an advocate for euthanasia. I think it's a very challenging issue, but, um, and I know that's something that New Zealand has been struggling with, just as Richard's struggling with his phone. Um, but I, it tells you something about the loss of autonomy uh, that this condition engenders, uh, that people um, uh, seek to shorten their lives. And the connection to this condition of frontal dementia, we've heard a little bit about it, um, but it's also a very challenging illness. You know, people think of Alzheimer's being a bit forgetful and you know, a neighbor who gets lost occasionally but actually leads a pretty good quality of life. This is a much more difficult illness. People change their behavior. They change their personality. I had a lovely woman in my clinic the other day who said, this is not the man I married. This is a very difficult, you know, unpleasant man. And he was the loveliest husband I, yeah, I could have imagined. I was very lucky to have 25 years with him. And now I'm wondering whether I can you know, stand another year living in the same house with this man. It's a very challenging illness. And these two conditions are connected, both through the genetics and through the pathology. So uh, Emma and others have talked about this molecule TDP43, which accumulates in the cytoplasm instead of sitting normally in the nucleus. And if we look in all the people who, uh, whose tissues we've got with motor neuron disease, we can tell uh, that they mostly have this protein called TDB43. And we can be 100% certain in life whether they've got TDB43, because the two other little elements of this pie are FUS and SOB1, and those patients have mutations in those genes. So I can take some DNA, test for those two genes. If they're negative, then I know the pathology is TDB43. And there are very few other conditions that I can think of that are like that, except perhaps Huntington's, which Richard works on. And in front of dementia, it's not quite as straightforward. Um, quite a number of patients have this tau pathology accumulating in the brain. Some have fuss, that's actually a slightly exaggerated segment there, but a large number have TDP43. So if they don't have tau, and we now have pet ligands for that, uh, they don't have fuss, uh, then they're very likely to have TDP43. And the exciting thing, of course, linking these two conditions up is if we get a treatment for one disease, 
it's very likely to work for the other. So that's a big plus. These are different genes that have been discovered over time. Um, the red and blue balls, this is actually uh, from Am one of Amar's many publications on the subject. Um, the size of the balls reflects the frequency of the mutation in the population with this condition. This is uh, ALS MND with the red and blue, and this is frontotemporal dementia in the green balls. And you can see that some of them are the same. So C9 off 72 commonly causes frontotemporal dementia, but also is the most common cause uh, for ALS MND. And of course, uh, we're discovering more genes all the time. So this is the kind of proportion of patients that we can give an answer to who've got a family history of frontotemporal dementia, just over 50%. Uh, we can say we can identify the gene defect, but it's also present in the number of people who have sporadic disease. In ALS, we're even better off. We've got about 70% of people we can give a genetic answer to, and the same genes are present in sporadic disease. But what this great, these two graphs don't show you is that this is nine times larger than that, nine times larger than that. So the number of people with a gene defect uh, who, who've got the disease actually have no family history at all. So the myth that this is all a familial genetic disorder, as Emma was pointing out, is entirely in inaccurate. Okay, so um, we've discovered lots of genes. Um, that's been helpful in terms of putting pieces of the molecular jigsaw puzzle together to tell us uh, what is actually going wrong in cells. And we're not going to go through them all, but some of them talk about the shift of TDP43 in and out of the nucleus and starts to accumulate in the cytoplasm, a failure of uh, the proteasome or the autophagy pathway to clear uh, TDP43, disturbance and transport around the cell uh, leading to TDP43 accumulation or defects in energy. So these are all kind of common pathways that I've talked about within the neuron uh, that, that tell us that TDP43 might be accumulating. And if, I guess if you're thinking about the therapies, you might want to target those areas um, to develop um, a, a, a drug discovery program. So what we do is we've got a clue from human genetics. We can put those mutant genes into cells. Uh, we can take uh, cells from our living patients, turn them into stem cells, and study what their motor neurons look like. Obviously, we have uh, donations of brains. We can put the genes into flies, fish, and mice, and study these, uh, the development of the disease in these animal models. We then get some ideas about the key elements that are going wrong. Uh, protein recycling, axonal transport, energy, and the transport across the nucleus. And we can use those to screen uh, molecules in, in our own laboratory or with um, industrial collaborators. And the idea of then, of course, is that this leads to uh, testing in our animal models and then hopefully clinical trials. Uh, and ultimately, that this would bring new medicines to people with ALS and FTD. Now, I've been working with industry, and many of us here have been doing this for 10 to 15 years. And we have got absolutely, well, I have got absolutely nowhere with any of them. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's really depressing to have set up an entirely automated system in which they're about to screen 300,000 compounds. A new chief executive comes in, completely closes that program down. I, I think that's pretty bad. Much worse for colleagues of mine in Belgium who were using... Um, a pump which had been inserted into the brains of their patients with motor neuron disease uh, to give a growth factor. The new same chief executive closed that program down. The patients had actually had the pump inserted surgically into their brains and they never got a single dose of the growth factor that they were supposed to be given. Yeah, this, this is the kind of problem. This is the reason that we have tried to set up our own gene therapy company so that we have control of these matters and we can make these decisions. Anyway. So um, where have we got to? Well, you've heard about Riazol. It, it has a modest effect. Um, the really depressing thing in New Zealand, of course, is that people were denied access to it. Um, I think it is an important in our armamentarium of therapeutics. It isn't enough, but it's a good start. Uh, there's a drug which isn't currently uh, available in New Zealand or the UK or most parts of the world called Adaverone. This is actually some small-scale survival data suggesting it does have some uh, um, improvement. Ridazole is a tablet, Adaverone is actually, at the moment, an injectable drug, which is given daily for two weeks, and then you have two weeks off, and then given daily again, which seems a bit like a sort of permanent chemotherapy regime, and I think would be very challenging for, for patients. Aside from that, we have a fantastic multidisciplinary team, and as Orla showed you, that makes a huge difference in terms of people's survival, but also their quality of life, which is what most of our focus is. And we work very closely with palliative care physicians, many of whom are in the room, um, who, who do make the greatest difference in terms of managing patient symptoms and, uh, uh, and the, their care. So that is where we are at the moment. 
this is where we want to be. So um, I've been following the genetics of making your own disease for nearly 30 years. And um, at the beginning, I, I was saying, look, I, I can't promise that our discoveries will help you, um, but I believe that they will bring new therapies for your children. And now I'm seeing their children in clinic, and we haven't really had any new therapies. So this is what Emma referred to as, it's time for us, or me anyway, to stop trying to discover genes and figure out how things work and to actually try and develop a therapy. And, and that's the plan. So sometimes I look in the mirror and I think, old dog, new tricks. This, this could be a very bad idea. But I'm working with some really smart people who, who are helping uh, to try and make this a reality. So this is the other condition I was going to talk about. And I'm using it as an example of how gene therapy can really work. It's called spinal muscular atrophy, and the type 1, people with type 1 disease um, have very low levels of the survival motor neuron protein because their principal gene uh, is defective. They've inherited a defective gene from both parents. The parents are well because they've got one healthy copy of the gene. And these children, they never sit. They never crawl. They never roll. They never stand. They usually never talk because they have a tube into their um, the larynx, uh, in, in, into their um, um, chest uh, at an early age so they can be ventilated and they live like this so they have a little bit of movement in the hand and they can operate the uh, robotic um, uh, movement of the wheelchair there's a ventilator under the seat here and she's got a permanent tracheostomy which isn't a high quality of life so there are two now almost three new treatments coming for this disease uh, and one of them I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, which is this uh, Gene therapy, it's a virus which is given to these children in the first few months of life. And inside the virus, it contains the gene that they're missing. And what's really remarkable is the virus manages to hunt down the motor neurons and deliver that gene to the motor neurons sufficient for them to survive those first few years of life. Uh, and I've got a little video at the end um, which will show you the outcome of that um, intervention. But the exciting thing was, of course, there were no children ventilated at the end of two years on that first trial. And then uh, my own small story uh, is about this lady who I first met about 25 years ago. And she is New Zealander who lives in London. And she came to see me about her family who had um, two, I think two siblings at that stage had motor neuron disease and passed. Some of the members of this family are in the audience, so I'll be very careful. Anyway, she's absolutely lovely and very crazy. And um, she was a delight to meet 25 years ago. But then, of course, she came to see me because she developed symptoms. And it turned out that she carried the same defect uh, in the SOB1 gene. And fortunately, a trial for SOB1 G therapy started at that time. Now, I don't know whether she's on the active drug or whether she's on the placebo. Uh, she doesn't know whether she is on either of those. Uh, but what I can say is that in the last two years, she does not appear to have changed at all. And she declined quite rapidly in the first year of her symptoms. So I'm hopeful that actually she's on the active drug. Now, I think she's on the open label stage. And she's, Chris McDermott actually is here and has had delivered this entire therapy for this patient. Um, sorry, Chris, I should have mentioned that earlier on. Um, so um, I, you know, I think this is an absolutely remarkable story. And I'm going to show some evidence of that in a minute. So this is what antisense oligonucleotides are. Um, they're basically tiny little fragments of, uh, of, of DNA. Uh, this is the normal process that happens. This is DNA. It gets transcribed into an RNA, a, a pre-mRNA, uh, which needs to be stitched together to make the final gene. The gene is the uh, transcript here, mRNA. Uh, and that leads to protein synthesis when it gets out into the cytoplasm and binds to the ribosomes. And this is a protein being made here. All the amino acids being put together like beads on a necklace. Um, well, if the gene is actually a gene that you want to knock down or inhibit making the protein because the protein has a mutation and is toxic, um, you can try and d uh, develop these antisense oligonucleotides, which prevent the normal splicing of the gene or prevent its translation. Or alternatively, you can try and uh, bind to the RNA and attract an enzyme called RNase H, which basically breaks up uh, the uh, mRNA so it can't make the mutant protein. And that's a very, very powerful inhibition of uh, the toxic process. So the advantages are that you can uh, vary the dose. Uh, you can stop the drug, but there's quite a bit of a washout. 
Um, there's good cellular tissue distribution because it's a tiny, tiny, tiny molecule can get into the nervous system. And then, gee, most of these therapies are now being injected into the spinal fluid. Um, the disadvantages are it is injected into the spinal fluid because that's an uncomfortable uh, experience. And for some therapies, like spinal muscular atrophy, it's every three months, but actually in the SAR1 trial, and Chris can correct me, it's about every month that these patients need to have uh, an injection. Uh, so that's quite a challenge, you know, and I think it's amazing that it works, uh, but I imagine in the fifth or sixth year, you might think, hmm, a monthly lumbar puncture, you know, maybe I'd, that's not such a thing I want to look forward to. Um, the other thing is that it does actually affect every single tissue. So if the target led to toxicity, then there could be problems with other organs, and I think that's something that's important to think about. So uh, uh, there is a gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, targeting exon skipping in, in SMN2, which does work, and is licensed in the US and is now approved by NICE. And I think in New Zealand it's still under consideration, but not has actually been um, agreed to be paid by Pharmac. I think the company uh, has uh, allowed some patients to receive it, um, but that's on a sort of named patient basis. Um, the SOB1 trial, which is really exciting, um, uh, it seems to be very effective. And we've just dosed our very first patient with uh, the C9 ORF72 mutation. Again, not trying to knock down a, a nasty mutation. Okay, so that's our lumbar puncture. That's the injection um, that I've talked about. Those are the trials. Other diseases in which these drugs are being tested include Huntington's, Tau, and Alzheimer's disease, and obviously the Biogen one. And what are the results? Um, so obviously when you're trying to knock down a mutant gene, you hope that the protein levels decrease as well. And there's a slightly complicated slide, but the blue line is placebo, patients who were just injected with saline into the spinal fluid. And then there's a range of doses from 20, 40, 60, and 100 milligrams. And what you can see is that 20 really made no particular difference. Uh, 40 made some difference and 60 made some difference, but 100 milligrams really did knock down the amount of mutant protein being made. So that was pretty good. And then we heard a lot about the uh, ALS functional rating scale, which all it doesn't like, but it's, there aren't very many other options, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's something to be getting on with. Um, the people who, are on, who, who, who were on the placebo uh, and who have rapidly progressing disease really declined very rapidly, and you can see that rate of the slope there. Um, these patients with this particular mutation, A4V, often live no more than 12 to 18 months, right? The same people who are on the drug and now have absolutely um, unchanged in terms of their function. So the disease was essentially arrested. Even people who have more mildly uh, progressive disease, their disease has been arrested as well. It looks like this drug stops the disease in its tracks. Now that will be consistent with the story uh, of my patient, um, but obviously there's still more data to come. It looks like it, it does something similar with improvements in respiratory function, which seem to stabilize, and also muscle strength, which seems to stabilize. So this is a really dramatic event. And when I first heard this, this is about a year ago, in the meeting in Glasgow, you know, I had tears rolling down my cheeks because it was such an extraordinary outcome. The sad thing is, I've had two, three patients subsequently come to my clinic diagnosed with SOD1 mutations that we've not been able to get into trial, and two of them have died already. So I see one woman who's not progressing because she's on the active drug in the trial, and others who are not having access to those drugs and who are progressing and dying, which is a very hard stage to be at. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the different therapy, which is the virus. This is the virus I'm up there, little tiny ball. It's like a flu virus, probably one of the ones I've caught in Australia. Uh, and inside it, you can put in the genes that are missing, uh, and you can put in any gene pretty much you want. This is uh, basically a measure of whether the children survive long enough uh, when they went on to ventilation. And basically by this line here, every child with type one spinal mass retrovery would be on a ventilator. And in this trial, none of them were, which was very exciting. This is a muscle score with a maximum score as being 64. In, in infants and children, it's obviously difficult to test muscles normally, but they have a very good system for doing it. And a child that didn't respond particularly, this is a very typical low-level score that you expect in a child with spinal muscle atrophy type 1. And no child with type 1 has ever got a score over 40. All the children who responded got scores over 40. Two of them have almost normal scores. So. Uh, really, a really remarkable 
result. The bad news is um, the company was bought um, by one of the very large um, uh, pharma companies called Novartis, and they are charging $2.1 million US dollars for that injection. So some insurance companies are actually paying this. Uh, but you can see that's a pretty prohibitive thing. Now, the cost of manufacturing antisensical glucotides is minute. The cost of managing, manufacturing the virus is enormous. Um, but it's not 2.1 million, right? So, so this is something that needs to be addressed. That's, again, the reason why we're trying to do this ourselves, is that we build some competition, uh, and then we try and make these, these drugs available to people. OK, <clears throat> so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, put into uh, uh, the virus capsid uh, interesting genes that we're interested in and in trying to promote, either genes that would supplement uh, a gene that was missing or deficient, or enhance a pathway that was important, or knock down a mutation that's toxic or a pathway which is contributing to the disease process. And this is just a green protein which we can show when we inject into the brain, we can see cells that turn green all over the brain from a single injection. And, and that seems to be going on for possibly years, possibly decades, these expression. This is just a mouse uh, brain that we've injected. These are the different genes. This is the different uh, uh, programs we've got. We're trying to supplement proglanin because that's a deficiency. We're trying to knock down C9 off 72. We're trying to knock down this pathway, ataxin 2, which we believe may help everybody with TTP. So it wouldn't be just if you have a gene defect, although it can be a defective gene. And then we've got a slightly crazy pathway trying to switch on the heat shock proteins, which essentially refold uh, or clear uh, abnormally folded mutant proteins. So I won't go into this in great detail, except to say that if we are supplementing a gene and we can measure the protein in the blood and spinal fluid, we should be able to return patients up to essentially normal levels. In these patients with frontal dementia, we can follow brain volume loss, and you've seen some wonderful images from Martin earlier on, uh, and what we're trying to do is arrest the progression of the volume loss. Uh, and there are other sort of uh, pretty interesting markers in the back of the eye. You can start to see changes in the back of the eye associated with disease, which we hope to be able to uh, follow as well. So we hope to be in clinic uh, within the next two years with this new drug. Uh, and this is, again, some mouse brains that we've injected with that particular protein, progranulin. This is by intraventricular route. You can see the green, this is green staining now, not just a green protein, but this is actually a stain for the protein that we're trying to get into our patients' brains. This is when we put in an intrathalamic injection, and the thalamus is able to deliver the protein all around the brain, almost in its entirety, at quite high levels in the areas that we want to see. So we're very optimistic about uh, that gene therapy. The second program is ataxin 2, uh, and this is the work of Aaron Gittler, who's an absolute genius. Uh, and he first studied in yeast and then in flies and showed that if you knock down ataxin 2, you could predict that against TDP43. Uh, and then he did this experiment where he took a really super aggressive mouse model of motor neuron disease overexpressing uh, the wild type um, TDP43, and he crossed it with um, an ataxin 2 knockout mouse. So that is the mouse that's missing ataxin 2. Now, these mice are actually healthy. Uh, they don't seem to have much of a problem. These mice all die in 30 days. Right? They're sick when they're born, and they're all dead in 30 days. Half of them are dead within a week. Um, so it's the most extraordinarily aggressive mouse, and I would have told them never to choose this mouse because you're not going to get an answer. In fact, some of the mice now live beyond 400 days. Okay, Dead in 30 days or living 400 days, that is not a subtle outcome. I probably would have called the editor of Nature at that stage and tried to get that published, but he went on to do uh, another interesting experiment, which was to use the drug, the antisense drug, to knock down ataxin 2 at birth. Remember, these mice are already sick. They've already been accumulating TB43 during their embryo embryonic development. Um, and it wasn't quite 400 days, but some of them lived out past 160 days. So again, showing that this is a really powerful pathway which we may be able to knock down and ameliorate disease in people with sporadic disease, which is basically everybody with, with um, motor neuron disease could benefit from this if they have TDP43. Okay, we aim to be in... Hmm, I got a little flute as well. Uh, uh, in clinic by 2023. Okay, so we've got mice that get all these different disorders and we're going to try and use those to help decide how we're going to progress. I'm going to make a little very quick comparison between antisense oligonucleotides, uh, which we've talked a lot about, lots of evidence that they're very powerful, but it's lifelong administration that makes pharma happy. 
They can make lots of money out of that. Um, the cons, uh, mm, patient heavy. Cons, high cost to patients and providers, limited use, non-cell type uh, specificity in recurrent lumbar punctures that are meant to be patient unhappy, I think. <laughs> lots of lumbar punctures. I misspelled that, yeah. Viral vectors. Um, fantastic. I mean, really very powerful uh, evidence from lots of other disorders in which they seem to work. You can knock down genes as well as supplementing them. You can actually, hopefully in the future, edit your DNA and RNA, which would be pretty cool. And you can really tightly regulate tissue and cell type specificity. Patients very happy. Single shot injection. High cost of manufacture, some risk of toxicity, single shot therapy for life, long effect, pharma unhappy because they don't get lots of money going on f in the future. So uh, I'm obviously on the case of making patients happy and pharma not necessarily quite so happy. So I won't go into that in any more detail. Um, just to say that there are technological advances coming to make this more affordable, more achievable, and safer. So then I've just got a little video, if you could play that. And this is a story of spinal, spinal muscular, muscular atrophy. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA type 1, is the leading genetic cause of death for infants today. A devastating fact this family knows all too well. Our first daughter, she was diagnosed with SMA type 1 at 6 months of age, and she passed away at 15 months old. This is a disease that is devastating for infants. A large percentage of patients die before one year of age, but 95 plus percent are gone, unfortunately, by age two. SMA rapidly robs babies of their ability to move, talk, swallow, and eventually breathe. When Milan and his wife Elena found out they were pregnant with their second child, Evelyn, they prayed for a healthy baby. Unfortunately, that was not the case. When she was born and the results came back um, and uh, found out she was positive for SMA type 1, and we both kind of just broke down. We found out about the clinical trial here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. This is really the first time that we've been able to apply gene therapy to any neuromuscular disease. Today was a very special day for Evelyn. She was given genetic therapy for her missing SMN gene. Babies with SMA are missing a gene vital for development. Through a one-time injection, gene therapy replaces this missing gene. For Evelyn, this gene therapy worked. We start seeing changes as early as two months after treatment. She started to push and she started to get, get more, more active, holding her head up. And uh, a little after three, four months, she rolled over on her own. Now three-year-old Evelyn challenges Dr. Mendel to a dance-off at her annual follow-up appointment. She comes back after three years and she runs up to me and hugs me and says, Dr. Mandel, I love you. I forget that she has SMA. This is a healthy girl and she does everything that a normal three-year-old uh, child would do. Something like that has never been achieved before. With our first daughter, it was just devastating to lose a child. You lose all dreams you had for their future. And now we can actually save for college. Okay, so um, that's quite a hard watch, isn't it? But it is pretty remarkable that some of these therapies are making such a big difference. And I'm not sure that there's a, an easy success in motor disease just around the corner like that. But I think the, we're learning a lot from these early successes in other fields to, to be able to try and translate that uh, to treat people with motor neuron disease. Thank you very much. That these are <laughs> all the people that have done all the work. Of course, I don't do any of the work. Um, and it's funded by lots of different people. But uh, thank you very much for listening. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Zara Binti, who is the very, very brand new curator of the New Zealand uh, MND patient registry. So the registry was launched in May 2017, connecting people with MND to researchers and enabling their particip participation in research studies, including um, in my own lab, 
So here to talk more about the registry, please welcome Zara, who has very recently been appointed and she hails from Pakistan where she qualified in medicine and surgery from the Services Institute of Medical Sciences, Lahore, in Pakistan. So Zara moved to New Zealand in 2016 and she spent some time exploring our beautiful country as well as working on registering with the Medical Council of New Zealand. Thanks, Zara. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to talk to you all today and representing the Motor Neuron Disease Registry. And I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for this opportunity. Uh, I also want to extend the apologies from Dr. Richard Roxburgh, who is currently overseas attending another conference, and I'm doing this presentation on his behalf. And I also want to say that the work that I'm presenting today is the work of Carrie Walker, who is the previous registry curator, and she has definitely done an amazing job. So I'm going to give a brief overview about the Motor Neuron Disease Registry in New Zealand, its work, and the recruitment process of the participants. So Motor Neuron Disease Registry New Zealand is a collaboration between the Motor Neuron Disease Organization and the research group of Dr. Richard Roxburgh. It's a very powerful tool as it allows us to collect and uh, secure the data about the people who are affected by the motor neuron disease in New Zealand. It also helps us to lower the barriers between the researchers and the participants of the research. And it also helps to accelerate the research and the transfer of knowledge between the researchers and the participants. It also means that we are able to collaborate with the international registries through our registry. And it also helps us to identify the participants who might be able to eligible uh, to participate in certain clinical trials. So it all started back in 2016 when the idea of having a registry for the motor neuron disease patients uh, in New Zealand was first conceived, and it was first launched in May 2017. Uh, Dr. Clare was the first consenting participant, and you can see all the Dr. Richard Oxberg in the picture, who is the principal investigator of the registry. Beth Watson was the first president, and Professor Paul Tallman can be seen in this picture, who is the principal investigator of the Australian Motor Neuron Disease Registry. So what's the recruitment process of the participants? Um, the recruitment process of the participants starts by taking the consent. People hear about our registry through various sources, from their family, friends, uh, from their clinicians, sport workers, social media through our websites as well. Once we get the consent form from our patients, uh, we register the details about uh, the demographic information and their clinical data in a secure database that is based in Auckland DHP. We also store the clinical information about the participants in an online database system, which is maintained by Australian Motor Neuron Disease Registry. <coughs> When we get the research request from the researchers, that information about the research and the request is forwarded to the steering committee. The steering committee is composed of researchers, neurologists, and also the representatives from the Motor Neuron Disease Organization. After their approval, um, the data that is in our database, it is made available to the researchers um, anonymously. This is a very new development, as new as me. Uh, it just happened last week. Um, we identified that there is some difficulty in filling out the forms by our participants, and it's more time consuming for them to send those uh, through post. So Kerry Walker actually worked efficiently to get these forms approved by the ethical committee, and they are now live on the website. So anyone who wish to be part of the registry can uh, go on this page and click on these two icons, and they can give the consent online. And all the patient information and uh, uh, forms are available there, and the process is quite simple. This is another picture uh, of the page. Uh, it's showing the participant information sheet, and this is the online consent form. 
These are the numbers about the registry at the moment. Uh, we have 211 participants on total, uh, out of which 160 are the active participants, which are from throughout the New Zealand. Registry published this paper last year in November 2018, and it is very important as it highlights the work of the registry on international level, and it makes sure that international researchers are aware that our registry exists, and the participants are happy to be contacted should there is an international clinical trial available. These are the research study for which we have uh, recruited the participants um, already and the upcoming research study uh, of Dr. Emma, which we are in process to recruit participants at the moment. A very important aspect of uh, the registry is the collaboration with the pharmaceutical companies. We are getting requests from them and we are also proactively contacting them uh, to make sure that uh, our participants uh, uh, can uh, participate in the research if there is an international clinical trial or there is a new drug available. That is all. These are the contact details of the registry. Please feel free to get in touch and please spread the word about the registry. It's really important um, and all of you can make contribution and help us to get more information about the participants and the people affected with motor neuron disease in New Zealand. Thank you very much. So the last uh, talk in this session, uh, before we go into some Q&A time in a, in a panel, is uh, by Dr. Angela Genge, and she was a late and very welcome addition to our program. We're very lucky to have um, Angela here. She's the Director of the Clinical Research Unit at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Um, she's been doing that since 2004. So the unit develops and executes over 100 clinical trials at any one time, with an emphasis on ALS also other rare, muscu rare neuromuscular disorders, multiple sclerosis, and primary brain tumors. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Angela Genge, um, presenting. For, I also have a small New Zealand connection. I come from another island. Canada's not an island, by the way. Um, I come from Newfoundland. Um, and I've been in Montreal for a long time. I moved there when I was five to start my clinic, so we're all getting younger. Um, um, but we have, uh, and I'm going to have to thank Chris because he's given an introduction to several of my slides. Um, and actually, I'm going to comment on a couple of these slides. But we currently have two patients from New Zealand living in Montreal to be part of the SOD1 trial. Um, so in fact, overall, there are three New Zealand patients in the SOD1 Biogen trial, which is actually probably more than any other country right now except the U.S. Um, but I'd like to go over a few different things. This is really an overview. Um, this is a super exciting time after a long period of disappointment in the treatment of ALS. What I'll give you is a taste of what's happening. Some of us have been at this for as long as we are sharing with you, and we've gone through many failed trials. Having Riliazol um, in most countries and Adarabone in some countries really is still only the very, very tip of the iceberg. Having a, and this actually will not be the game changer, but it's very, very possible that either ASO therapy or gene therapy or small molecules of other kinds will be the game, game changer and really catapult us into an era where there's a lot more drug discovery. I'm going to just let you know that because I am supervising 110 clinical trials, I work with a lot of pharma. And uh, through this, I've learned a lot about what we need to be doing in ALS, um, particularly from some of the MS trials some of the Alzheimer's trials. Alzheimer's has just had a massive breakthrough. 
it has had a drug that for the first time is going to the FDA as a, what we call a disease modifying drug. So we're about to see things change in Alzheimer's. Some of this technology that we're seeing used in, and, and Chris discussed for ALS is being applied to classic Alzheimer's, it's being applied to Parkinson's, and it's being uh, applied to diseases that are very similar or very much like these two diseases. So we're not the only disease that's struggling for therapies. Certainly we're one of the more acute diseases, but we really are moving into this new area of technology that's giving us a lot of ammunition. This is just a picture of the neuro on the left and my current crew. Um, each time I have to redo the photo because people go on to medical school and various other places, and I keep growing. So that's it. that's the other problem with the photos. Um, but we're pretty excited that so many things are going on in our field. Um, and making a difference in ALS has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. One of the things that in fact Chris did a great job of presenting is this ASO therapy. I'm not gonna go into more detail on it. I have a couple more slides, but I wanna point out to you why we care so much about this. Because this is a very, this is a technology that has changed our world, the world of the neurologist. We've mentioned, and I'll go through again what the criteria are what we're doing for ALS, both for SOD1 and C9, two different genetic forms of ALS. And by the way, I completely and 100% agree with Chris that we are under-recognizing genetic forms of ALS because we're calling it familial, and many even top quality uh, clinics around the world only screen people with a family history. And our rate of... Uh, a, we screen everybody, and about 90% of our patients who have genetic mutations have no known family history. So this, this, I think we need to change the name from familial ALS to gen, genetically mediated ALS, because we have to get people thinking differently. So these ASO therapies, super cool designer drugs, been around for five years. Actually, they've been around since 1995. They've been used originally in liver disease and in uh, some uh, hematologic disease. And it was a few years ago, I always forget which year, and a group of people had a discussion, decided that to use it in neurologic disease me meant to give it, rather than intravenously, give it intrathecally. So although once a month lumbar puncture seems extraordinarily heavy, it's still once a month, a therapy that looks like it's working in a disease that we know of as fatal. So this is a pretty extraordinary thing that has happened. This is another pretty picture. It's really very similar to, to Chris's. The point is, if you believe a disease is caused by any form of misfolded protein or any abnormal protein in circulation, the trick, which is what an ASO is, is to block the production of that protein. Now, we, every time we block a production of a protein, we worry about blocking it too much. But so far, we have not seen evidence that there's a problem with blocking the production of the SOD1 protein, which is misfolded ultimately in ALS. And that looks like it's going to be a viable clinical target. We'll know probably in at the end of 2020, because the phase three trial is still recruiting. As Chris said, this is an intrathecal therapy for ALS. It's an intrathecal therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. It's an intrathecal therapy for Huntington's disease. It's an intrathecal therapy for um, tau-mediated Alzheimer's. It's an intravenous therapy for a disease that's very common in Portugal, something called hereditary amyloidosis. And it's shown dramatic effect in hereditary amyloidosis. In fact, it's approved for uh, HTTR, the name of the drug is enotericin, and there it's delivered subcutaneously. 
So there is an opportunity. That we will be changing this eventually to be delivered something other than once a month, once a month LPs. Whether we'll be putting in ways or um, equipment, um, what's the word? Medical devices that allow us just to deliver it via the medical device once a month, or we'll find ways that it only has to be given once every six months, or some change in this technology. But just because we start with once a month doesn't mean we'll end with once a month. The SOD one, which is in this uh, phase three, uh, and it's important for people to. Um, overarchingly understand the reason that the study is still going on is that they're looking specifically now for patients whose disease is moving very quickly. And what that means is these patients are much rarer than if you're looking for all forms of SOD1. And patients whose disease is moving very quickly, often their disease is moving so fast that they actually can't get into a study. So clinical trials 101, when you are wanting to get into a clinical trial in ALS, there are a set of criteria for every clinical trial that you have to meet. Some of them are inclusion criteria, some of their, them are called exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria for this study, which is the one, as you now know, three New Zealanders are in one way or another, um, is that you have to have the mutation of SOD1. Originally, you could have mutations that gave any speed of progression. Now, we're, on the, we're only looking for patients who are fast progressors. And you had to be symptomatic. So it wasn't good enough to have a history and knew you carry the disease. But you have to have evidence on your clinical examination that you have a symptom. And your breathing has to be sufficiently good that you're allowed in the trial. So there are a lot of hurdles that patients have to go through to get into a clinical trial for, for even this trial, which is pivotal. So we work very hard to try to facilitate patients' entry into the trial. This current trial is a two-to-one randomization. That means that for every two patients that get the drug, one gets a placebo until the end of their active program. And there's, then there's something called the open label extension, which is where Chris and uh, Chris and Chris's, I should say, um, patient is. So there, once you're in the open label extension, you, you are guaranteed to get the drug at the maximum safe dose. So once you get through that first period, then you get the drug. In this particular study, you're allowed really is all on Udervone. That only affects certain countries, particularly the US. And there's a bunch of things we're following to make sure that, that not only do we believe that the drug works, that we can prove it. And that really references back to Martin's talk earlier. Biomarkers are not just a research interest. Biomarkers are going to change the way that we develop drugs in ALS because we're going to be able to see one of these biomarkers change before the clinical picture changes or somebody's physical um, examination changes, and we're going to be able to make better decisions as to which drugs go forward and which drugs don't. So all of this is really important. There is, this is another way to write it. I'm not going to go into it anymore, but the key point about the fast progressors is they have to be changing every month and they have to have good breathing. So we're, I'm struggling because I've had at least four patients who have been fast progressors with the SOD1 mutation who I can't get in the trial because by the time they physically get to me, their breathing is no longer good enough for the trial. So this, it's a really tricky thing to do to prove a drug effective in a disease like this. What else are we doing, though? Well, uh, Chris alluded to the c 9 orf 72 program. Why, why are we um, so excited about this program? Well, there are a lot more people with c 9 orf 72 worldwide. It's the, currently the most frequent genetic mutation seen in sporadic patients. So 
I've been screening for C9 or 72 and SOD1 for at least four years, every patient who comes to clinic. We're trying to get more and more people to do that. It's, it's continuing, it's moving, but if there's one, um, one um, test that needs to be done on every sporadic patient, if you have to choose, you start with C9 or RF72. What's important about this one is it is uh, still in phase one. There's been some new developments that means that we're in a pause period. It should restart next month. And we'll be looking for patients until we finish the phase one. There's an expectation on my part, which hasn't been confirmed by anybody anywhere, that if they see the same benefit with this uh, program, that they'll do the, what they did with the SOD1 and they'll try to get it to the pivotal trial, which is what we call the trial that allows regulators to approve the drug for everybody, to try to get that to a pivotal trial as soon as possible, and they can do that uh, with a certain mechanism of, um, of clinical trial design. So I mentioned how um, excited I am, obviously. There are two other uh, ASO technologies, uh, ASOs being developed, Strathman and Ataxin 2. And with that, we have really, with the ASOs, we have the first opportunity to change this disease unequivocally. And so we're really hoping um, we'll, that we'll get a really um, positive signal from this uh, phase three clinical trial. If you're in the clinical trial now and you roll over into the open label extension, at least in Canada, what that means is anyone in the trial gets to stay on the therapy until that drug is available in the country in which they live. So it, that is what is expected by Health Canada. An example in multiple sclerosis was, was a drug called Gelenia, which was um, game-changing for MS. And the company provided the drug for something like 10 years to the patients who were in the pivotal trial. So that's the other side of the clinical trial effort that you need to be aware of. It's, we are pushing very hard to make sure every single clinical trial has an open label extension so that any patient, any person who participates gets the long-term benefit if the drug is successful. But it's, it's super important to understand that it's not just they get it for six months and then then they go home and they get nothing. In fact, we push very hard that they get ongoing access to the real thing. This is another company, um, another pharma that has had a had the, a recent success and is now going to be in the ALS field. This company is actually Swiss um, and it developed the drug that is, has been game changing for Alzheimer's disease. It's a drug called aducanumab um, and it's currently being, um, the paperwork is being done, is the best way I can say it, to get the drug approved for Alzheimer's in the U.S. based on some positive trials. The company um, does something really interesting in that it's about, I think the company is about 20, 25 years old. And it came out of an idea that not everybody gets ALS, Parkinson's, and, and Alzheimer's. And the idea was, is it possible that the really healthy, really elderly actually developed antibodies that protected themselves from the big three? Is it possible that our own immune system, if it's particularly strong, is capable of fighting off at least the, the misfolded proteins that develop in this disease and therefore prevent the onset of the disease. That's the concept. So the founder, the per person who started the company, went around Europe to find as many, and in fact, I think he went everywhere in the world, uh, to find as many very healthy, very elderly people as he could find. I don't know if he stopped in New Zealand. I doubt if he stopped in Newfoundland, but he stopped a lot of places. These three men are, I think, at the time of the photo, 93, 94, and 95. They're three brothers in Italy, 
who own a restaurant and they eat good Italian fo food and they smoke and they drink wine and they're still sitting there at 93, 94, 95. So they're an obvious group to study because something must be good if you can do all those things and not get anything bad. So the con so what they did was really took the blood of these all these very healthy, very elderly and did some screening to try to find antibodies that targeted, in the case of the neurodegenerative diseases, specific mispolded proteins that we feel, even if they may not be causative, certainly are important in the, in the deterioration that occurs in these diseases. So right now they have aducanumab, which is an Alzheimer's um, monoclonal antibody developed from this technology. They have a drug for Parkinson's that is, um, that is a monoclonal antibody directed at alpha-synuclein. And we've just started the, the single ascending dose for a monoclonal antibody directed against misfolded SOD1. This is an IV therapy. Right now we think this one will be dosed once a month, IV as opposed to intrathecal. But stay tuned over the next year and a half to see if what has just been proven in, with aducanumab in Alzheimer's translates to both Parkinson's and ALS. So another new technology, like after 25 years, we're doing something new. It's really exciting. The, the other antibody that they're developing in conjunction with Biogen, in fact, the um, SOD1 antibody is in, is in conjunction conjunction with Lilly, uh, with a branch of Lilly. This was in conjunction with Biogen, is focusing on one of the uh, most abundant peptides that are felt to be um, pathogenic in patients with the C9 North 72 gene mutation. So we're talking about two different targets with a new technology that's intravenous. And within a few years, we'll know about these two. I won't even go into the um, gene therapy because Krista did such a good job. Um, and I probably have the same virus he, he got in Perth. I'm just a day behind. Um, but what I find most fascinating about gene therapy is that when I was 11 and working with um, one of the premier scientists in uh, neuromuscular disease, George Carpati, which he actually saw the gene therapy as a treatment for neurologic disease way back then. And so to watch what's happened and that video and know that we're actually not only in uh, SMA but going into uh, SOD1, ALS, and many other diseases is pretty extraordinary. The, uh, for those of you who, who think it's one little virus in one little capsid, so the capsid is a shell the idea is that the AAV9 has been found to be the best delivery system. So you watch Star Wars. I don't even the name of, know the name of the ship, but think of the Star Wars ship that, that has to be fully loaded. When they did the um, SMA therapy that you saw the little girl after uh, she received it, 400 trillion viral vectors were in, uh, injected intravenously. So it's not a one viral vector, one capsid, one, one, um, one injection. This is a pretty sophisticated thing, and to think that we're finally at the point where we can use it commercially is pretty amazing. So these are the new technologies. They're, they're affecting, they're targeting SOD1. Um, we should do a family photo of the three New Zealand patients somehow. Um, and then we can all use it. Um, C9 ORF and C9 ORF 72 is going to be, it's a slightly different um, distribution around the world. There are huge populations in Finland, there are big populations in, in Quebec, but they seem to be in a lot of different places. Currently, the C9 ORF 72 ASO is being used. Um, only for ALS, although there are plans to use it as well for FTD. In addition, we've got those new antibodies. 
and we have some ideas of what we're going to try in these technologies for uh, sporadic ALS, but is there anything else that we should be doing? I didn't even put cost up here, uh, Chris, because the cost is going to only come down when there's more than one product on the market, and then we'll see a huge change in the cost. I don't think it's going to stay where it is right now. But what else are we doing? Well, these are, those were the genetic treatments that are coming along, but there are a few other things, and I'm going to just mention these briefly with an emphasis on the last slide in two um, initiatives, one American and one European, to try to make our drug development go faster. I collaborate with a scientist in Israel at the Weizmann, and uh, we are basically on the verge in January of starting to treat uh, patients with ALS in a phase one using an old antibiotic. One of the most complicated things I've ever done uh, because of the, um, we'll probably write a paper on how difficult it is to use a repurposed old drug that is no longer being made. But in fact, he's actually, this project is really looking at biomarkers called microRNAs and really trying to use biomarker levels to drive um, our further uh, development of this drug. So this is a real application of what Martin was mentioning in terms of uh, biomarker development and how it will influence clinical trials. There is another study that is happening in Europe, um, which is I think a good part of TriCALS is involved. Um, it's a naturally occurring product, so it's been a very strange um, um, development process. In the U.S., people are using this over the counter, so, and so far I've not seen um, that many patients stick with it, so I don't know what the outcome is, but I think Chris, Orla, Amar, I think most of the European um, clinics are involved in this trial. It's being driven from a group in Italy. Ibutalast, which is uh, actually coming from the asthma field in Japan, of all places, is looking at um, seeing if you control a particular part of the, what I call the immune system, um, particularly the macrophage inhibitory factor, can you actually control the disease? Um, control or change the course of the disease. We have heard two different outcomes for two different uh, phase one, two trials for this, uh, with this drug. So I'm really not sure what we're going to find out. Uh, but at least we're starting to look at sporadic ALS patients and looking at new uh, potential pathways that may change the course of their disease. Adaravone, as we have mentioned, uh, we're caught currently with this IV formulation that is uh, every two weeks on, every two weeks off. Uh, patients get very tired of this. Um, it's approved in Japan, Korea. The IV formulation is approved in Japan, Korea, the U.S., and Canada, but not available yet in Canada. It's used in some countries in Europe through different mechanisms. Um, but it's, it's very difficult for the patients to use. So there is now a, a study which is going to try oral Adaravone um, and see if they can get the same uh, levels of drug using an oral formulation, which would allow us to get rid of the intravenous formulation. They, the company is also uh, under obligation to run a trial where they give the drug daily. So although we're dealing with Adaravone, IV two weeks a month um, as the current regime, I think that's not going to last too much longer. Um, and that will be good for every one of us, um, for sure. We, um, Canada's special, you know. Um, we do a lot of things very special. Um, we all not only have a younger prime minister than most of the world, um, but, pardon? Oh no, the New Zealand is New Zealand and Ireland. I think both have young uh, prime ministers. Well, ours could be. What can I say? Um, but um, we have now had, I think, two years of um, 
having legal, uh, legalized marijuana, which actually has not changed my practice that much because I've been prescribing medical marijuana, which has been legal in Canada for 30 years, um, medical marijuana for symptoms in ALS. There's actually some very old literature that suggests that uh, cannabinoids actually change the course of ALS, but this has never been proven. What we are trying to do in this little study is to see what symptoms that patients with ALS suffer from uh, can be relieved with uh, various uh, combinations of THC and CBD. We are, uh, again, very close to finally running this trial, and I think this is really going to be considered pilot data that we hope will lead to a more rational use of medical marijuana. Um, and the biggest challenge we had with this one was getting research-grade uh, marijuana. We, it was very easy to get all sorts of marijuana other than something that was research-grade. Um, so let me tell you, that was a two-year project as well. Coming on the horizon super soon is something completely different for us in ALS. We've talked a lot today about the genetic forms. And historically, uh, we believe that the, we know um, how Rilazole works, and we're not 100% sure how Adarivone works, but people are working on it. But there's now been a real push uh, based on some uh, preclinical work uh, to block part of the immune system, and we think that the blocking of part of the immune system and the part that seems to be uh, targeted now by at least five companies um, is the complement cascade. So complement cascade is known to all of us as an important um, part of autoimmune disease. It's the membrane attack complex um, that... Um, is the C5B um, to 9 complex that is, comes when you use a classical pathway, is known to be very important in dermatomyositis. It looks now like it's pivotal in a disease called myasthenia gravis. And we are at the point now of uh, starting a trial, or even two trials, in, by March of next year, targeting the C5B, the C5, inhibiting the C5 to block the formation of C5B, and in this way, potentially slow the progression of, of a sporadic ALS. So I don't have the official um, slides from this company. Alexion has at one phase three trial, and in one of the platform trials, which I'll min mention in a minute, there's also another drug ta uh, targeting C5. So we've got a huge change. We've, we're, we have a huge change in the number of molecules out there. We have a huge change in the pathways. I agree with Chris and others that we are closer um, with the genetic forms of um, ALS than we have ever been. And some of what I've seen has been absolutely incredible. I have a patient who was in the original phase one um, trial of SOD1 who just did a 5K mud race. So she's just, she blows me away. Uh, this is just not supposed to happen. So we're pretty excited about that. But we're also pretty excited about a few other things. There are two platform trials that are about to get underway. I'm not going to promise when either of them will, will start, but I think it's really important because it's the buzz on the internet. So if any, any of you know people who are on some of these chat rooms, they're talking about this. Um, these two platform trials are different, so it's important to understand, and I'm, this is my last slide, so I just want to explain to you what these are. Platform trials are trials that were started in oncology as a way to try multiple drugs at the same time and to reduce the number of patients needed in the placebo arm when testing each drug. So the idea is that you start a drug, and every time you, in ALS still, you have to have a placebo arm. In a platform trial, the placebo arm is shared across all of the different 
uh, drugs that are being tested, so you can reduce the number of people exposed to uh, placebo. These two trials, however, are very different. The, the Healy Center, which is the American platform trial, is built to really look at whether or not a drug can be taken further and whether or not it's going to have an effect in ALS and should be taken further to, um, to registration. There are four different compounds. I don't have the slide yet from Sabrina of the four different compounds. The four compounds work very differently, um, but that study is going to be um, what we call a phase two study. It will not be a study that will get us a new drug at the end. It's not a registration trial yet. It is a proof of concept or a phase two trial. Tricals, maybe Chris or Amar will talk about this afternoon. Tricals has a platform trial as well. Their platform trial is actually a phase three trial looking at an, uh, a couple of different compounds, um, three actually, depending on what your genetic background is. That trial, I believe you're hoping to start in 2020 as well. And that's another really exciting way for people to, to get involved in, in clinical trials. Both of these trials are really testing how we can how we can do drug development going forward. It's great that we have the SOD1 phase three trial, we have the abutilase phase three trial, we have the, um, we have the Alexion phase three trial, but we're looking to see if there's a way to do drug development faster. And we'll be working out the mechanisms to do that using the, uh, this particular trial design. At this point, the drug development activity is exploding. There's something like 60 or 70 companies looking to develop drugs in ALS. There's been a new diagnostic criteria that's been presented at the meeting this week that we'll be looking at using so that we can drop the, the possible, probable, definite categories and say you have ALS or you don't have ALS. We're looking, pushing hard to get genetic screening in every clinic everywhere. And we're pushing really, really hard to figure out ways to get patients earlier diagnosis and earlier treatment. At the end of the day, the most important thing that we can do is to make sure that we have really good multidisciplinary clinics, either the controlling types that Orla does, um, or the more less controlling collaborative uh, approach that, that we do, because we have four clinics in Quebec. Um, but every one of these things is going to be super duper important. So with that, I'm showing you another picture. Thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Just a question for Angela. It might be a really stupid question, but why is the respiratory fall off such a contraindication to registering for the trials? And if you had respiratory support, can you then be registered? So that's a great question, actually. Um, and it's one, in fact, I debated last yesterday. Um, the traditional reason that the um, respiratory parameters have been used as a cutoff for inclusion into trials is in part we want patients to be able to live long enough to be able to finish the trial and in part we're looking to if we have a positive effect which we hope we're going to start having that we will see that patients don't end up on uh, ventilator assistance because they're on the active drug. Um, there is going to be a push to change that. Um, that push will happen probably at the same time we give up on placebo arms. I don't think it'll happen before that. Um, unless the drug is not a drug that's supposed to modify the g disease, but rather a symptom um, management type of drug. I think it's almost time for us to let go of that in the symptom management uh, trials, because it doesn't make sense. What if it halted the progression? Would it not be as good if it halted the respiratory decline as doing another, you know? Right, and I think as soon as we see, start seeing that, we'll be able to move away from it. It's just a matter of getting a drug that we can clearly demonstrate 
works with our current technology, and we're waiting for Martin to give us something better. So tell Martin to hurry up. Thanks. But no one else was, so I thought I would. Um, it's a question for Emma, really, um, or, or anyone else involved in the register. What I wanted to know was, is the incidence of ALS different in New Zealanders of European descent and non-European descent? So we haven't used the register to, um, to gain that information, but in the mortality study that I presented, we looked at the uh, mortality of non, well, of Māori individuals, so our indigenous people, um, versus the total population. And it was interesting because we showed Māori are relatively underrepresented in those MND, um, in people that have MND noted on their death certificate. But it's unclear yet whether there are protective factors in that population or if it's actually just access to healthcare, because we know already that there are some very clear health disparities between Māori people and also our Pacifica people who come from the Pacific Islands and um, other parts of the population. So, yeah, please. So I think I think you need quite a large N to be able to do that definitively. Um, I mean, registers really have to mature to be able to know whether whether the information that you have is accurate. And we'd say maybe for the first three or four years, you can't really use the data in the registry and you should really... Uh, only interrogate the register for up to maybe a year before the date that you're looking at. But as you know, there is a, a pretty compelling evidence now that um, the um, ancestral origin, like I said in my talk, is a significant um, uh, uh, determinant of uh, risk. And, and that study that you um, discussed, the global burden of disease, <laughs> that um, uh, Giancarlo Logresino um, uh, published, um, the... the that they have corrected actually on that study for um, access to healthcare. And there's a study in the US as well that was corrected for socioeconomic status and action to, uh, access to healthcare. And um, it's still the case that um, ALS is a Northern European um, white male disease, prom pr primarily um, <laughs> with some variation, and that the rates are lower in, in other populations. So, so it's, it's, it's pretty clear that that's the case. Yeah, so I suspect that your rates are similar because your population that, that you're drawing from is primarily um, Northern European, Irish and English, or English and Irish, maybe. Thank you. Um, I'm just here as a lay person, so this isn't a very sophisticated question. Um, uh, wonderful presentations, thank you all. Um, I'm just wondering about the um, options for New Zealanders to participate in clinical trials and um, whether you, know, you can participate even though you live here or do you have to move to Canada, basically? <laughs> <laughs> well, so... At this point, and that's actually a great question, um, and New Zealand is not unique in this. Um, the, at this point, your best access from New Zealand is actually in Australia, but trials are not run in every country all the time. So what you will see is an unevenness around the world. Um, in terms of where you can go to have a trial. And certainly there's an opportunity in New Zealand if you have a, a f uh, push for this um, to develop your own clinical trial infrastructure. Um, I'm sure you do trials in other in diseases other than ALS here um, and probably link into the it's called the Pan-Asian, the Pactels, which um, Australia, and uh, countries in Asia are currently uh, really developing as a clinical trial network. So from one, just for, from one small country to another, okay? Because we, we're a small island and we're next door to a larger Ireland uh, that's going to not be in Europe quite soon. <laughs> so we have a, 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 a kind of a very complicated relationship with our nearest neighbors. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so a very large country, um, and beside a small country, so there's 56 million people in the U U UK, and there's 4 million people in Ireland, so we get swamped a lot. But uh, what I would suggest to you is that 
the, the register will drive the access. So we get, we, we're a small country, we get trials now. So we, we um, do many of the major pivotal trials in Ireland now, uh, despite being a small country. There are issues about things like uh, clinical trial organisations don't want to send a monitor to a different country because it's expensive. But if you have a very uh, strong register and a very strong network <laughs> and, and can show that you have um, uh, very good clinics, um, and that you can deliver really quickly. And we were, we were the first in Europe in a number of trials recently. Um, then I think there's no reason why New Zealand can't participate, but you have to drive that through your register and through your multidisciplinary clinic. So that's the really most important thing, I think, just to show that you can do it. I completely agree with that. And we've been conscious for a long time that the therapies that are coming on the horizon and that are in trials are genetic therapies, so we need to have appropriate genetic screening available for everyone. And as Wallace says, we need to have everyone registered. We need to know their clinical details, what is their breathing capacity, um, at what rate they're progressing. So I think the registry will really underpin that. And there is a huge opportunity there because we know that we actually do have quite a number of patients who have SOD1 mutations. That's probably why we've got three of them in clinical trials internationally. But there's a position there where, and in fact Debbie I'm sure will have something to add to this, um, where if we have a strong proponent for running the clinical trials here here in New Zealand, running it, running us as a trial site, then you know we've got the got the people here. So, I I wondered if I could add to that. I'd I'd say that New Zealand is very well respected as a clinical trial site. Um, we had the opportunity and actually did all the pivotal trials for MS drugs. Um, we get and in fact on my uh, email this morning was uh, two companies asking about ALS trials. Um, and so I think that we do have those opportunities. Our resources are a bit thin, and, uh, and, so, and many of them run through the DHBs, and I think uh, people can make, you know, this is where it helps to get advocacy for DHBs to enrol in trials. Clinicians here uh, are few and far between. They need to run the trials. <laughs> Um, and it's a lot of work, and uh, as any of you know, on top of your clinical work. So um, it, is, it is something that we need to advocate. Might I like to just take this opportunity, as the person who has the patients who are in Canada, to thank you very much uh, for all of your work. And I think this shows two things. One, that those patients advocated for themselves. They found these trials before I did and that you then uh, did an enormous amount of work to allow those patients to travel to Canada as a family and be involved. So thank you very much. I think that's probably a good place to close the session. If you have any other burning questions, um, we'll... One at the end. OK, we'll go for one more. Tony. Grace, you said that the angle called the wrong bank and ground environment was not largely to be blamed. So, a question for Grace with the agricultural background? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so and is it that banged up my other studies internationally? Is that backed up by other international studies? Yeah, actually, it's not only our New Zealand study showed people actually exposure to agriculture chemicals had relatives elevated rates with them, and they actually found a lot of international studies showed the same findings. But the thing is, with agricultural chemicals, it's like big cocktails. We can't really point which type of chemicals. So that is we try to work it out. But mainly it's incidence or pesticides. So there's a, a big European study um, called Euromotor. The population-based studies in, in um, Ireland, Italy, um, the uh, three sites in Italy, and um, the Netherlands. Yeah. And so we looked at this and, uh, and using job exposure matrix, matrix matrices, and we saw a, a, um, or, um, 
a similar sort of pattern, but the trouble is that all of those um, exposures are linked to one another. So if you see one exposure, you tend to see many others. I'm not quite sure what to do with those data. I'm not sure I completely believe them in, in our studies either. Um, but uh, and it was driven in some populations more than others. So I'm, I'm still not very certain that that's really the case. I, I think we do need to do a bit more work on it, I think. So right before lunch, I'm going to do a plug for Amar, and hopefully he'll mention it. Uh, Amar um, and Dr. Keo from Italy did a debate at the uh, meeting last week. And Amar's <coughs> position, Dr. Al Shalabi's position, is it's all genetic. And Dr. Keo's position is it's all environment. And we all believe it's some, somewhere in between. But maybe he can bring up some of those slides for people later. Because it's a very interesting issue, because when you develop ALS and there's no family history, your first thought is, what happened in my life that triggered this disease? And that's a very difficult question to study. So maybe it's just because it's somehow in your family, or maybe it is because you played a midfielder in a football. It's a gene environment. <coughs> <coughs> No, nothing between say a piece of size, and um, so so no development. Is there any known links between pesticides? Is there any known links between pesticides and soil cell development? Yeah. Cell development. <coughs> Is there any known links between pesticides and cell development? For example. I mean, there's links between basically anything in cell degeneration. It's really about context. It's about how much of a thing you deliver to a cell um, and in, in what context. So. I think we, we also have to recognise that I can give you a case report from the 1830s, which you would read and be in no doubt that it was ALS. And that predates, you know, a lot of industrialization and, and chemicals. I think we have to, to weigh that 